The House Transportation Policy and Regional Governance Committee will come to order. And uh, is there someone who would like to move the minutes, please, from the meeting of March 12th? So moved. All right, Regina, Representative Barr moves approval of March 12th minutes. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. The motion prevails and the minutes of March 12th are approved. All right. We have a very full agenda, um, and I'm sure everybody wants to go to other places this evening. So um, first up is House File 3593 and Representative Nash, and thanks for coming back uh, this evening, Representative Nash. Um, so I'll make the motion, that House File 3593 come before the committee and be re-referred to the Transportation Finance Committee, so. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Members, um, this is a bill that deals somewhat with MinLARS, but it is not the MinLARS bills that we have been talking about. It's got nothing to do with the software. It's got nothing to do with what happened during rollout. What it is, is a bill that is reflective of a business decision that was made um, prior to the MinLARS launch as to how work would be done by deputy registrars. The department made a decision, as we've heard in various testimonies, to essentially shift 40% of the work that was going to be done uh, previously in the back office now to the front of the office or at the window for the deputy registrars. The work that has been admitted by the department has been about a 40% shift, as I said. And this bill is reflective of a price change, not a price increase, but a price change uh, or a payment change back to the deputy registrars. Um, and again, it's really just reflective of them doing more work and us realizing that they are doing more work. So we are splitting the, the payments back to them and we're increasing it. And uh, Mr. Burris did a, a great job and Mr. Lee uh, are both available. If we could, uh, I know this is a policy committee, if we could walk through the policy piece, if you wouldn't mind, uh, and then would stand for questions. I know that there are testifiers. That's home calling. It's the hotline. Uh, but Madam Chair, if we could do a brief walkthrough as to the, the parts that we need to cover tonight, um, and then we have testifiers. Very good. Um, Mr. Burris and uh, the summary, that will be very helpful. So, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, or Madam Chair and members, uh, so House File 3593 has a, a couple of different parts that kind of interrelate with each other. Uh, the first is in Article 1, it's to create a new aid program, kind of reimbursement program that would uh, uh, allocate funds to d both deputy registrars and driver's license agents. Um, so it, it um, identifies uh, an, a, an account that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the funding of it. Um, it lays out uh, how the aid is distributed and it's, it's by a formula that, that splits the funds between deputy registrars and driver's license agents um, and uh, and also sets up uh, ongoing transfers as, as part of the funding mechanisms um, and kind of going along with it in, in the creation of the account there's the, and the, uh, the transfer language there's a um, explicit authority given to the department on establishing uh, reserves in their operating accounts. So the, the, that, that aid program is kind of the first piece and there's, the, there's some funding of um, the account from which the aid is provided. Uh, the, the second piece that's largely in Article 2 is to um, also, from, also fund, the, fund the account and the aid program from a couple of sources of um, related to motor vehicle transactions and uh, fees associated with the motor vehicles that currently are deposited in the general fund to instead go into this new reimbursement account. Uh, Article 2 also contains a, a modification to the um, retention of some license plate and validation sticker fees. So this is kind of the, the um, separate from the aid program, a, a, a change in the, in the funding streams so that uh, a portion of plate fees would be retained by deputy registrars instead of the entirety going into one of the operating accounts for driver, driver and vehicle services. So you'll find that in Article 2, Section 1. Um, and then there are also some uh, restructuring of um, 
how plate fees are established and those are largely technical and conforming changes that uh, have, the, have the effect of centralizing uh, fee establishment into one table instead of identifying fees in, in a bunch of different sections of law. So there's a repealer that uh, removes uh, an obsolete or duplicative fee um, and then a number of changes around uh, ref cross-referencing. Um, so that, uh, that, that third piece that I kind of referred to is, is the reallocation of the, of the general fund dollars. That comes from a couple of different um, fee-related sources, and this is in Article 2, primarily Sections 4, 5, and 6. And with that, I'll uh, kind of jump back to the aid program and where the dollars are coming from. So I had touched on the these uh, reallocations from the, from what currently goes into the general fund, instead going into this uh, aid account. Um, the the second stream of funding that would go into the aid account potentially uh, comes from account balances in the driver and vehicle services operating accounts. So as the committee re may recall, there are, there are two main operating accounts for driver and vehicle services. One is for the, the driver side and one is for the vehicle side. And those accounts are, are uh, funded through various types of fees that are associated with driver licensing and motor vehicle transactions. And historically, um, account balances have been built up in, in uh, both the driver and, and vehicle accounts. Um, and th those are the accounts that uh, fund the core uh, operations of driver and vehicle services through biennial budgets. So what the bill anticipates is pulling a portion of whatever, re whatever balance is sitting in those accounts after appropriations uh, and after setting aside re reserves and an additional set aside. Any additional dollars sitting in those accounts would be transferred into the new aid account and uh, from there distributed under the formula. I can get into further details if there are any uh, follow-up questions on all that. All right, thank you, Mr. Burris. Um, at this point, uh, I think you've got some testifiers then? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have some testifiers and uh, I think Mr. Barthel has the list of folks. Right, I have um, Gay Smith, Cindy Geis. Uh, why don't we have those folks come forward? Welcome, Ms. Smith, again. So why don't you give us your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ms. Olson for her acknowledgement in yesterday's testimony in this committee um, on the shift of the workload that has happened to the deputy registrars. And unfortunately, that shift load did not come with any extra revenue. So. This work shift now is the responsibility of the deputy registrars. And to give you an example of this transaction, I'm going to kind of go through a very quick, but not quick, transaction of a uh, title. And that title with entering all the information Normally we gave that form to the customer, they would fill it out. They could go over on the side, we could help another customer. Currently right now with Minlars, they come in, we stay with that customer from start to finish. And as we're doing the transaction, we grab those supporting documents, the titles, look through that, bring up the record. If we have a valid record, then what we do is we go in and we do the title transaction. So if we're transferring this title, now we're going to put in the full VIN number where before we just put in three, the last three of the VIN. We put in that VIN number, we then have to pick the color, we have to pick the make. All of these are drop down menus and as we got faster, we can kind of see, well, SE and we'll start entering some of those. Um, 
and then it comes to gas, diesel, electric, or unknown, and if the customer is not there, and if you don't know what, what it is, it goes as an unknown. So if that documentation is using for any statistic reasons, it won't be valid. So then as we're entering all the rest of the information, it comes down to do we need a renewal? As we do the renewal, we have to enter in the sticker and the plate, the county. We have to pick the county and it's all typed out. It's not numbers. Um, calculate fees and then we continue on down, enter in the driver's license number of the individual and currently right now that information pulls, I'm not sure, but I think from the e-support system and my understanding that may not happen with FAST. Then um, if we're lucky that will enter in the information, otherwise we then have to enter in first name, last name, middle name, date of birth, and if there's any sir at the end, for, such as junior, senior, third. Then we continue on, um, and if there's another owner, we do the same thing for that owner. Then we continue down, enter the address that that title wants to go to. If the customer is new to the state and they have a mailing address, then we enter the mailing address. Then we continue on down, enter the insurance uh, company, policy number, and the expiration date. Then we barcode all the uh, supporting documents, do those supporting documents, scan them into this application, and before we go to the cart, we print the actual application because we want that customer to look at it to make sure that it's valid. If we've made an error or mistake on it, we have to start all over. So if we transpose a two or three for an address, um, then at that point, we put the plates and stickers together, go to the cart, and when we pay the cart, then we print out that application, and then we attach all the strips to that. Normally, that took on an old pre minlar system that just went into kind of a general, the e-support, we were just entering this in more as a financial, so it was the last three of the VIN, first and last name of the customer, uh, the fees, and the plate and sticker number. So it was very quick, and then you went on to the next transaction. Premium Lars, it was all done at the back end, hence why there weren't as many lines for customers. Now it's done at the front end, so that customer has to stay with us. <coughs> So in regards to that, um, we are looking at at least a minimum of a 40% plus increase in how we handle our work and we are mandated to use the state system, state forms. We don't have any option. We follow the rules and regulation and it's our responsibility to make sure that they're all correct and current. And we all take our job very seriously. So we want to keep these offices open and we want to have the ability to serve our citizens from as many hours in the day as we can. A lot of us have had to decrease our hours of service. Uh, some have closed and I know of two now that have closed. Um, both of them are county offices and there are a couple offices that are maxed to the hilt on their credit cards trying to pay their bills and haven't taken a paycheck from their office for eight months. So this is badly needed to continue the support of that service out there to our citizens and uh, to keep all of these people employed and get that money going in our economy like we currently do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh Ms. Smith. Um, now we have Ms. Geis. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I am actually not please Cindy give us your Geis. Name for the record, please. Yes, my name is Julie Hansen. I am the oh. Deputy Registrar for Scott County, as well as the Property and Customer Service Manager. I'm here representing Scott County as well as the Minnesota Association of County Officers today. Um, I'd like to thank Gay for her testimony. Um, 
I certainly, she did a great job of explaining, you know, the very detailed differences of what we did before versus what we're doing now. Um, you know, and just I would say in summary, um, the interaction with the customer, the time with the customer has greatly increased where we, in the legacy system, really what we were doing with the customer at the counter was verifying the information that they were giving us, making sure the information was right, verifying the information on the computer, compare and contrast, as well as collecting fees and whatever financial system the offices have. So that was a pretty rapid process versus like she described, um, it is a very lengthy process at this point. Um, but what I really wanna talk about today is that um, representatives from MACO, Minnesota Associ Association of County Officers, have testified before this committee in the past that they knew there would be need to be a bill for ongoing operational expenses. We knew as soon as Minlars hit that this is what you know was going to need to happen. Uh, we have seen other bills come out to do a, a one-time reimbursement. We heard about that today. Um, but we cannot stress enough that in order to ensure that both public and private deputy registrars are able to stay open, that something like this needs to happen. We provide essential services to our citizens. Um, and currently they're, they're being double billed. I mean, if you look at it that way, especially at a, at a county office or a city office, citizens pay property taxes. We are using those property taxes to keep our offices running. We have the luxury of property taxes as do city offices. Private deputies do not. Um, I am very thankful I've had not to, had to put any of my ongoing expenses on my credit card. <laughs> um, but people are paying double. They're paying through their taxes and then they're paying through the fees that they pay in our offices and uh, we don't think that that's fair to be double taxed. I testified earlier today that Scott County has a small office in Elko New Market and that a couple of days after the Minlars rollout, we were forced to close that office. We cannot manage um, the current processes with Minlars with our existing <coughs> staffing complement and with the overtime and the increased production time, we don't have the budget to add staff. We're trying to be very creative about how we're going to handle these challenges. I think we've come up with some great ideas, but ongoing operational money is what we need to have to maintain the level of service that the deputy registrars all across the state have been, have been known for their fantastic service. We just want that to continue. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and I would absolutely stand for questions. Very good, thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify on the bill? Oh, I see someone, someone's coming. Welcome to the uh, committee and please give us your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Kelly Davison, the owner of the Prior Lake License Bureau, Deputy 160. I've worked in the industry for 34 years. I employ 22 people in our local community. My business is in jeopardy and I, along with my employees, the community and the dealers we serve, respectfully request your support for House File 3593. As a state appointed deputy registrar, we receive our funding from the filing fee we collect on transactions associated with the fee. The Minlar system has changed how we operate and requires extensive <laughs> data entry at the front end of the transaction. The deputy registrars are now keying data that pre Minlars was handled on the back end of the transaction at DVS. No changes were made to the deputy fee structure to compensate for additional data entry requirements that were anticipated by DVS prior to the rollout of Minlars. In order to process the same number of transactions we were able to do prior to Minlars, I have hired four additional employees, which still are not enough, we have found out. Deputies are in urgent need of financial relief. I am operating at a loss daily. I have had to pull money from my retirement account to keep my doors open. I had to shorten my hours from eight to six to eight to four so I could have my full staff all there handling the work, handling the, all the work of Minlar's data entry. 
our office participated in a time and motion study that was conducted by an independent CPA firm. We logged our processing times during two periods, one pre-Minlars and one post-Minlars. The study confirms the additional time requirement indicated, indicating our processing times for renewal notices have increased by 80% and title transactions have increased by 62%. Please support House File 3593 so we can continue to serve the citizens of Minnesota in the way that we used to. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And is there anyone else that wishes to testify? Looks like we're, we have one more. Okay, Ms. Ms. Olson. And welcome to the committee, Ms. Olson. Good evening. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Don Olson and I'm the Director of Driver and Vehicle Services. Let me start by saying that I have seen and listened to and witnessed the challenges that the deputy registrars have had to face with the Minlar system. I've been in their offices, I've listened to their concerns and I, I share their frustration and their disappointment. Um, the department is here to support a resolution <clears throat> that will work to keep them viable and operational. I wanna talk a little bit about the bill that's before us today and a couple of the items of concern that I want to bring forward. This bill proposes creating an appointed officials reimbursement account and redirecting funds that are currently sent into the general fund and the DVS vehicle services and operating account. This bill proposes for every transaction processed by the deputy registrar, they retain 40% of the plate fee. Let me be clear, fees that are collected for plate transactions are not a source of revenue. It's an it's a mechanism for us to cover the cost of plate production. This production process is supported by an appropriation that we reach from HUTD funds, as well as our operating appropriation. To give a better explanation of the plate production process, MinCor, of course, is our producer of our, our license plates. When, we, when they produce a set of, of standard double plates, MinCor charges us $6.33 for that plate. Um, we are only allowed by statute to collect $6 from the customer at the time of renewal. This difference is calculated and corrected by the additional amount that we charge for specialty plates, personalized plates, and the HUTD appropriated funds. <clears throat> the other thing to consider is that DVS pays for all the plates. Once a plate is ordered or a shipment of plates is ordered and they leave Rush City, we are charged for those plates. Deputies can order any amount of plates that they need and they're respectful of the inventory, but they carry these, carry these plates in stock and we are charged for those plates at that time. We do not recover the cost of these plates until that plate is actually sold. In conclusion, I just wanna say um, we are not done yet with the fiscal impact of this bill, but some of our early estimations are around that the impact to the general fund will be around $13 million and around $3 million to our vehicle services and driver services operating account. And I'll stand for any questions if there are. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Olson, for your testimony. And uh, do we have anyone else? Okay, so um, any, uh, looks like we. Well, Madam Chair, I, I know that your so. time is in uh, high demand. Right. Members, this bill is an attempt to make sure that the people who service your constituents and mine, um, who have under really no request of their own been forced to do more of the work that has previously been done uh, by DVS, previously on the back end, now they're doing it at the front end. And we've heard testimony before that that decision was made for them and they have to comply. And I, I can't imagine that any one of us want to look at a deputy registrar in the eye or one of, our, one of our, our constituents in the eye and say, you know what, we know that the state made these changes but we don't care about who gets paid or how they get paid or how much and we, we are okay with them operating at a loss. So members, uh, this bill has a couple more stops and I'm uh, very open to 
uh, input, but folks, we this decision was made by the state and it is impacting deputy registrars and it is our job here to fix that for them. So members, I appreciate your time. Madam Chair, I appreciate your support. Thank you, Representative Nash. Actually, there is an amendment um, and, uh, and, a, and a comment. So the DE1 amendment, I don't know who is bringing that. that yeah, we're, I'm not doing that amendment. Okay, all right, thanks, Representative. And uh, Representative Iwakim, did you have a comment? Question. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Nash. I haven't had the avail uh, opportunity really to dig into this because I haven't sat on the um, funding committee of transportation finance. Um, so I've been following it along and reading the materials, and I'm really happy that you're bringing forward something to try to fix the issue. Um, you did mention that the nature of this really does sound like an unfunded mandate. And we have a lot of those up here. So I look forward to maybe working with you on some other unfunded mandates that we pass on to our schools too, would be great. I just am a little bit concerned about the mechanism. This seems a little complicated to get them the money that they sound like they need right away. And wondering um, throughout the bill why it doesn't get to them until fiscal year of 2019. Representative Nash. Madam Chair and members, that is an amendment that I know we will be uh, engrossing into the bill. And if that was the DE amendment that you had, uh, we wanted to change the effective date to this calendar year. That was a drafting error, and we, um, I thought we were going to be doing that tonight. And if we wanted to do that as an oral amendment, if uh, we were so kind to do that, that would be great. Um, but to your question, um, there's, a, there's really a difference. There is some immediate relief that they need because of the software aspects of MinLARS. That is not what this bill does. This bill addresses a programmatic change that was decided on their behalf. Uh, without any input from them so that as they move forward into 2019, 2020 or whatever, that, that shift in work still will exist. So these are separate issues, if you will, that we're, we're not dealing with emergency help for them in this particular bill. And um, my apologies, member, I thought we had a, a author's amendment to deal with the, uh, the effective date, but I'll take care of that in the, the finance uh, stop along the way and Representative Hortenstein you've got my my assurance on that but members this this isn't a bill to deal with the emergency aspect of it this is a bill to say we know that the work requirements have shifted we recognize that as the legislature and we are changing the way this money is sent back to the registrars to get them paid for the work that, that they're now doing Representative Hornstein, did thank, you have a question? Thank you. No, just a quick comment, Madam mm -hmm. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Nash, for bringing this forward. And um, I agree with you that uh, through no fault of their own, the deputy registrars have you know, been on the front lines of all sorts of issues this summer and fall. And I, I very much concur that we, we need to, um, to make them whole and to, and to make these processes easier. I was going to do an amendment, but I'm not, Madam Chair. Uh, but it's just a sort of... Um, uh, express it just a general concern. Again, the the direction, the, the concept, I completely agree with. It's just that I think that there are going to be some costs uh, incurred by DVS. They talked about the, the license plate manufacturing question. There's other costs. And I, you know, what my amendment did, and I hope you might consider as this moves forward, is taking $10 million from the general fund to, to cover these costs. And um, you know, I think, again, we have a, a little bit of a surplus, and so, um, uh, again, we want to make sure that DVS services are protected. We want to make sure that the deputy registrars are protected so that we can move on from this sure. sad uh, story that we've had to all experience. So I'm not offering it, just something to consider. Okay. All right, Representative New. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Nash, just so, just so I'm clear, um, this is work that used to be performed by DVS that has now been shifted to the deputy registrars. Is that correct, Representative Nash? Madam Chair and Representative New, yes. Oh, okay, Representative New? Madam Chair. Um, so this was not, I mean, we, we have a fiscal note attached to anything we do at the legislature. Theoretically, DVS uh, was, was given their funding to do this work, and they have now shifted this work to the registrars, correct? Representative Nash. M Madam Chair, Representative New, yes. And, and that's really the, the, the crux of the argument is the work that had been previously done behind the scenes by however many employees were doing that work has 
that's not being done anymore. That's been shifted to the front end, and that's the argument that I'm making is that we should take that money that was being appropriated for the back end workers and uh, find a way to get it to the deputy registrars. And, and Representative Hornstein, this, this bill by no means, because none of them are perfect, um, and I'm happy to work with you as the lead on, I believe, both finance and policy. Uh, uh, but, uh, policy Representative Hornstein? For, for okay. Uh, well, r irrespective, I'm happy to work with your side because I, I really do view this as something that we should be coming together on. Uh, you know, this issue was created to Representative News um, point, this was not something that they signed up for, and it was done previously behind the scenes. So our job as legislators is to step in and, and find ways to create corrective measures. So I, I appreciate the question, and Representative Hornstein, I'm, I'm happy to work with you anytime on this or whomever else uh, from your side would like to. Oh, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, that's great. And, and like I said, I think, uh, I, I hope there'll be general fund money available for the deputy registrars reimburse their costs okay. uh, Representative, uh, lost <laughs> effort so that's that's the area I'd like to work with you on uh, and madam chair and representative Hornstein I, I understand that we could come up with a general fund solution for a short-term situation but this is going to go on in perpetuity right and and, both. and we can't use the general fund now to create something that's going to be going on in per perpetuity because that just doesn't ma work mathematically so if we change it programmatically I think that that creates a situation where the deputy registrars can say, I know this is how much I'm getting paid. And they as business owners can say, I know how many people, how many, how many of these I can process in an hour. And I can hire the commensurate amount of staff to do that so that they know this is what I get per transaction. Here's how many people I need to create or process the number of transactions. And now they can make their business whole again because currently, uh, to, to use the old joke, they're, they're losing money on every transaction and they can't make up for it on volume. So, uh, Representative Nash, and I, mean, I think that the, uh, the more we hear about it, the more we're getting a, a bigger picture and understanding, you know, how complicated it is. And um, certainly the fact that there are 174 different offices, perhaps each with different ways of going about business. I mean, there's that feature too. I think there's a lot to explore, but we aren't going to, in this, week or this legislative session probably get to the full understanding of how, of how the system is working currently and how it should work. And But thanks for bringing the bill. Madam Chair and uh, members, thank you for your time. Was, I'm sorry, was um, there one oh, more question, no, I'm Representative done. Mason? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just mm -hmm. kind of following on what Representative ha uh, Hornstein was talking about, there's no question that the deputy registrars have, are under tremendous strain and we need to, we need to make it up to them. But in the meantime, uh, Ms. Olson said that they are being, the price that they're being paid, that they pay for the license plates or allowed to, or at least allowed to pay is, they're, they're, not, they're going to be losing money on the license plate. So is that anything that you've taken into consideration how to deal with that? Representative Nash. Madam Chair um, and Representative Mason, I'd be happy to look at that again. You know, I, I, we also heard from Ms. Olson that they are able to make up for uh, potential costs in some of the specialty plates that are created. So I, I think that looking at that uh, plate fund as a way to generate money to, to put it in, back in the hands of the registrars, uh, is still a very good way to go, but I'm very open to talking about it. The long and short of it, members, is that this is a decision that they didn't make on their own. It's been forced on them, uh, and you and I can make the decision on how to correct it, and I think this bill is a great step forward. Uh, it's got steps to go still, but, and we can do this this session, and we owe it to the people who are here in this room. We owe it to the people who are in your communities, because quite honestly, the, the alternative is not one that I think any of us want, which is it all becomes a, a new department and is all centralized down here, and we tell small business owners that we stop caring. So, I, I, and that's obviously a hyperbolic situation, but we have to fix this. This has to get right. done. So very good, thank you. No Thanks question. for the conversation and the discussion, members. Um, and I'm going to re-renew my uh, motion to re-refer House File 3593 to the Transportation Finance Committee. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion prevails. Thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Nash. And next up, we have Representative Miller and House File 3548. And Representative Miller, I will make a motion to move your bill to the General Registry. Register. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for hearing my bill. Uh, agriculture faces unique challenges that are at times different from most other industries. It's because our product lives, breathes, dies, and rots. Its freshness and health are important. My bill today addresses one of the challenges agriculture experiences and different from most other industries. Our product needs to get it to its destination on time no matter what. Right now, the state of Minnesota recognizes this need and allows for exceptions for transit of agricultural products many months out of the year. My bill addresses the reality that these products are now transported year-round and allows for these rules to be placed year-round. Madam Chair, I have a few testifiers who can further explain the need for this bill. Thank you. Very good, Representative Miller. Uh, I see Mr. Clavin, so welcome, sir, and give us your name for the record. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Bruce Clavin. I represent a number of groups here, the Minnesota State Calamans, the Minnesota Turkey Growers, the Chicken and Egg Association. Uh, quickly, the guts oh. of this bill uh, date back actually kind of to 1996 <clears throat> when we first put in what's called the planting and harvesting season. That was a result of a federal law change back in 1994. States were asked to set a planting and harvesting season for each state back then. And we met with the patrol back in 1996 and talked about what those dates would be. And you'll see them on line 1.13. March 15th to December 15th. And the idea back then was <coughs> we probably would never have a circumstance where we'd plant wheat prior to March 15th with the frost. And we probably realistically wouldn't be combining too much past December 15th. Now I recall advocating that we should do year round back then. And I lost that argument. North Dakota does year round. And North Dakota probably has a shorter growing season than we do. They've gone with January 1st to December 31st. So that's what happened in 96. You'll see in line uh, 1.15 beets were in there. Why are beets in there? Because after the blizzard in 97, we had a shortage of drivers and some hours of service issues in 97. So in 98, we came in and put that in to bridge the winter. Essentially, the, the breakdown of this bill is that farm trucks, farmers, when they all their own product, are, are never subject to hours of service. They can work as much as they need to. On the commercial for hire side, they're capped by the planting and harvesting season as defined by the state. What we didn't contemplate back then was livestock, because it wasn't really an issue. So why are we here now 20 years later? We're here now because of the feds. The feds introduced a, an electronic logging device. It became effective in December. The electronic logging device is, has no flexibility whatsoever. If you exceed your hours, the truck literally shuts off from what we understand. So when you have a load of animals sitting by the side of the road, this could be a problem. So by making the years, the planting and harvesting season year round, we essentially stretch the policy from nine months that we currently have to all 12. And Madam Chair, that's the bill. Short and sweet. Um, any um, comments from members or questions? All right. Anyone from the audience wish to testify? Okay. Welcome to the committee, sir. Oh, boy. Please give us your name for the record. Uh, Josh Anderson. Welcome, Mr. Anderson. Thank Please you. Please proceed. Thank uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, thank you for taking the time to hear House File 3548. It's great to see so many familiar faces of the old committee. Uh, the idea for this legislation, folks, was born out of a conversation I had with some friends and neighbors after a night of bar bingo at the Springfield American Legion. With the then impending ele electronic logging device mandate coming down, some area farmers asked me to simply, quote, find out what we have to do to be legal. They mentioned several different state laws, federal laws and possible exemptions that one may qualify for to satisfy the rules laid out by the FMCSA. It was my research for them into this matter that leads us here today. After discussion with various members, language was crafted for what would become House File 3548. This language would accomplish two major goals. First, it incorporates a federal exemption provided by the FMCSA for interstate transportation for those who transport aid commodities. This exemption would be applied year round in Minnesota under the proposed language. Second, it extends a current state law that allows for a 150 air mile exemption for those who transport agriculture commodities or farm supplies for agriculture purposes from the dates of March 15th to December 15th to now being year round. By incorporating the federal exemption year round, Minnesota would align ourselves with neighboring states such as Iowa and North Dakota who have these same laws currently on their books. 
It is my belief through several conversations with transporters, farmers, enforcement officials, and folks at the FMCSA alike, that with our laws conforming to the states around us, understanding these laws and exemptions becomes much easier. Without passing this language, the exemption provided by the FMCSA for transporters coming from Iowa or North Dakota will run out at the Minnesota border. Through this legislation, grain elevators, ethanol plants, feed mills, and packing plants can rest assured that commerce across state lines will not be interrupted. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Burris for his work with me, helping to better understand 221.031. Uh, it's a treacherous portion of statute, and I don't think we often thank our nonpartisan staff enough, so thank you, Matt, for all your help. Uh, I'd like also like to thank the staff here at the House of Representatives uh, for helping this bill along the way, and Representative Miller, I'd like to thank you uh, for carrying this bill. With all of your help, uh, we would not be here today. So uh, House File 3548 is a strong bill for Minnesota's agriculture communities, and I hope it earns your support. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. And uh, is there Mr. Preisler wishing to testify? Welcome, sir. And please give us your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is David Preisler. I'm the uh, CEO for the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to echo the comments made by Mr. Clavin and Anderson and thank Representative Miller uh, for, uh, uh, for leading um, the effort on this bill. A couple of additions um, on the practical side of it. Um, as we uh, move livestock from farm to farm, as we move them also to, to processing plants, animal welfare is our top priority. In fact, all truckers of pigs um, are required to complete transport quality assurance certifications in order to even transport pigs. Um, the consistency that would be afforded uh, by conformity to the federal CFR would be helpful and what is also create expectations that are shared as we look at uh, trucking animals within Minnesota and also our neighboring states. Uh, livestock trucks are set up to provide the best animal welfare for the animals when they are in transport, um, whether that be in the summer or in the winter. But either way, it depends on air flow um, going through the trailer. And so if we just arbitrarily stop these trailers, will end up uh, compromising animal welfare. So thank you very much for your attention to this matter and uh, appreciate your support on the bill. All right, thank you, Mr. Preisler. You're making a lot of people happy, it sounds like, Representative Miller. It's a good I, bill. I do, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, well, I'll, we'll go ahead. Um, I didn't think I saw any questions, so. Uh, Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam. The, I'm looking at the 150 air mile radius. How long a drive could that possibly be? <coughs> Is there uh, someone, Mr. Mr. Anderson, would like to testify on that? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mason, uh, the way that would work is it's it's a designation set out by the FMCSA and the state alike. Uh, it is 150 air nautical miles. Is the um, it's just what they choose to use for their units of measurement. So um, it's it's up to the transporter, the logistics specialist, the folks that set that schedule, the dry owner operator themselves to know where that 150 air mile boundary is. This law, Madam uh, Madam Chair and members, already exists in state law. There is 150 air mile for nine months out of the year in Minnesota right now. What we are requesting is for an additional three months and to be able to transport products across uh, state lines. Okay, so you're not Senator changing Mason. the time frame of the driver, you're just changing the months. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. that's correct. Representative Miller, okay. okay. All right, so Representative Miller, I will go ahead and renew my motion to re-refer House File 3548 to the General Register. All those in favor signify saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank Miller. Right, next, uh, next we have Representative Lean, House File 2990. A good question. This has been Lean. Welcome, Representative Lean. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members, for uh, hearing my bill this evening. And I'll uh, make the motion, Representative, to bring the bill uh, to bring the bill before the committee and be laid over for possible inclusion. Very good. So, thank you. All right. Please. This please is explain House. The bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is House File 2990, and it would allow the Department of Public Safety the authority to issue temporary permits for vehicle purchases, expiring registrations, and plate replacements up to 180 days. 
Under current law, temporary permits are issued up to 21 days for vehicle purchases by Minnesota residents, 60 days for expiring vehicle registrations and license plate replacements, and 31 days for vehicles purchased by non-Minnesota residents. This bill would help Minnesotans avoid tickets and citations because of expired plates and registrations, or for Minnesotans who have purchased vehicles uh, but do not yet have the plates and registration information. While the legislature, the Department of Public Safety, and Minute uh, find solutions to fix MinLARS. I do have an amendment, Madam Chair, which I would like to have moved at this time. All right, is that the author's amendment A1 then? That is correct, yes. Okay. Do you want to, um, I'll move that amendment, and do you want to explain that to us? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment would allow the Department of Public Safety to target the expanded 180 day uh, temporary permit policy to the citizens who need them based on their specific needs and circumstances. The amendment would also allow the Department of Public Safety to target the time frame for when these 180 day temporary permits would be issued, again, based on individual citizen needs and circumstances. All right, any questions on the amendment? All right, all in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion prevails. All right, do you wanna, is there anything more to explain then about your amendment or your bill? Any other testifiers? Madam Chair, that is my bill. I will stand for questions. Okay, did you have any testifiers? I do not. Okay, all right, and this came from the department then? Uh, actually, here. this, uh, Madam Chair, this was a bill that I had come up with myself um, after sitting in on the Subcommittee on Government Responsiveness and Technology. We had a hearing in early December on this issue. I thought this was a way that we could provide some relief to Minnesota citizens who are caught in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of this uh, Minlar's problem uh, due to no fault of their own. I will say that the department did bring the amendment forward, again, just to uh, really target the relief that I'm trying to provide here to the Minnesotans who need it most. And Representative Lean, are there other circumstances other than this current Minlar's situation where people need an extension? I mean, those, are, well, those would be what? Is it pr primarily the titling and, and that, things that, that is happen? correct. That is correct, Madam Chair. Primarily the uh, registrations, the license plates. Um, I don't know that the title would really play into this just because that'd be more for vehicle purchases, I suppose, you know, if that was something the department uh, felt they needed to use this policy for that issue, um, you know, they would have that. I don't know if the department wants to make comments on that, but as far as I understand, this would be primarily for the plates, tabs, registrations. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if that's good for, for the folks here, then, then we're good. Okay, I will renew my motion to uh, re-refer House File 2990, and uh, we're going to lay that over for possible inclusion. So, thank you, Representative Lean. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, moving on to uh, House File 3528. Representative Kosnick, you're up next. <laughs> Representative Pasnick, would you like to Madam move Chair. your bill? Would you like to move your bill, please? Uh, I'd like to uh, move House File 3528, I believe, to the General Register. Very good. Very good. Please proceed uh, and tell us about your bill. Uh, this bill um, is deals with uh, salvage titles and kind of um, the beginning or the genesis was with uh, some of the hurricanes that were happening uh, last summer um, and the flooded vehicles and other parts of the country we were concerned that um, salvaged or, or damaged vehicles would be brought into the state and we there was uh, some news uh, articles about uh, vehicles um, loopholes in the titling system that people consumers may be uh, sold unknowingly vehicles that were in fact damaged in, in other states and, and brought here and their titles were cleaned cleaned up. Um, so up to about uh, a million cars suffered damage during hurricanes, uh, Irma and Harvey, according to uh, Cox Automotive. Now many of those vehicles will make it to auction and have their titles marked by insurance companies as flooded or sold off uh, for parts. But 
and, and that's uh, a lot of cars are that way. But others could also, like I mentioned, end up in the used car market as scam artists figure out how to get around flooded uh, markings on the title. Uh, according to Carfax, as many as 7,000 flooded cars are on Minnesota roads from previous storms. Uh, sometimes people may choose to purchase a, a vehicle that has a salvage title, and, and knowingly, knowingly that's their choice, but uh, this bill will close out some loopholes that um, they would not know if the title was cleaned up uh, through a couple of exemptions. And so maybe Mr. Burris can explain uh, those for us, um, but otherwise we'll just stand for questions. Mr. Burris, do you ha have some things to add? Not necessarily, okay. Right. Do we have a Kevin Fisk in the audience who would like to testify? Welcome to the uh, committee, Mr. Fisk, and please give us your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Fisk. I'm with LKQ Corporation. We are the nation's largest provider of aftermarket, recycled, and remanufactured collision replacement parts and products. We have uh, 11 facilities throughout the state uh, in Elbert Lee, Blaine, Brainerd, Invergrove Heights, three in Minneapolis, uh, one in Northfield, one in South St. Paul, St. Cloud, and one in Wyckoff. Um, I'm here today in support of House File 3528. Uh, under current Minnesota statute, uh, salvage title is only required for a motor vehicle when an insurer acquires a late model uh, vehicle, which is five, uh, or which is vehicles five years old or newer, or a high value vehicle. Uh, those are vehicles worth more than $9,000 pre-damage. And that's as part of a uh, paying a damage claim or when an individual acquires a vehicle with an out-of-state title or the vehicle has uh, been acquired by an insurer uh, as part of paying a damage claim or the vehicle has repair costs in excess of its value or the vehicle has an out-of-state salvage certificate of title. Uh, this legislation seeks to address that problem uh, of total loss or salvage vehicles using this uh, late model high value loophole to masquerade uh, as reliable used vehicles when in fact they've been damaged extensively, uh, either through collisions or uh, water damage due to flooding. This is a consumer protection bill. Uh, consumers should know if their vehicle has sustained prior damage regardless of the age or value of the vehicle. As you know, uh, title and branding standards are controlled at the state level, and each state determines its own branding uh, classifications, title transfer rules, and all other issues relating to vehicle ownership and control documents. And since statutes, regulations, and rules vary by state to state, some are good, some are deficient, and some are non-existent. It also means that state statutes uh, can lead to inappropriate branding standards, uh, loopholes, exemptions, and deficiencies in state titling and branding regulations have the same net effect as title washing. Uh, this allows badly damaged vehicles to re-enter the marketplace <coughs> with no way for a potential purchaser to be aware of prior damage history unless that damage is voluntarily disclosed by the seller. Uh, this fragmented system uh, creates many opportunities for problems in the salvage and used vehicle markets with risks for the integrity of the resale market and for potential purchasers who may unknowingly buy badly damaged vehicles with clean titles. Uh, title branding for damaged vehicles serves to properly document prior damage uh, for subsequent buyers. Uh, frauds likely to occur when vehicles are not properly or accurately branded and can lead to uh, badly damaged and superficially repaired vehicles being offered for sale with clean titles. Unfortunately, this can result not only from illegal uh, activities, uh, but is also sanctioned by law in a few states like Minnesota due to lo loopholes and exemptions uh, like those addressed in this bill, uh, regardless of the severity of damage. Water damaged cars often show uh, no warning signs until electrical systems fail or anti-lock brakes or airbag systems malfunction. And recent major floods, as the sponsor has mentioned, have uncovered fraudulent and state sanctioned branding avoidance of these types of vehicles. Um, 
Late spring, early fall floods in Colorado in 2013 uh, revealed many vehicles exempted due to the six mile a year cutoff Colorado had effect uh, at that time. Uh, thousands of flood damaged vehicles were exempt from branding and could be resold with clean titles. And as a result, uh, the Colorado legislature decided it was time to close a loophole and pass a law in 2013, the 2013-2014 uh, legislative uh, session that removed its model year exemption. <clears throat> and in recent wake of hurricanes, uh, Harvey and Irma, uh, Minnesota has been pointed out uh, by local and national media uh, as a buyer beware state where consumers face a heightened risk of fraud due to loopholes in the state's law uh, that make Minnesota a prime target for criminals uh, looking to run title washing schemes. Uh, according to the Minnesota Attorney General, fraudsters use the laws that, that vary between states and this lack of uniformity to their advantage. And floods aren't the only time when we see these sorts of issues. Experian conducted a thorough study in 2008 in which they identified in a six month period 185,000 vehicles whose titles had been washed through transfers between states by taking advantage of the state's branding loopholes, translating to roughly 300,000, 370,000 branded and washed titles in a single year in the U.S. Uh, unknowing, uh, uh, purchasing, uh, unknowingly purchasing previously damaged vehicles threatens consumer safety and finances when consumers buy cars that are more badly damaged than they appear. Criminals disproportionately target low income communities when they purchase the Rex at auction, rebuild them, and put them back on the road by selling them uh, to cost conscious buyers under a clean title. Buyers of these vehicles will suffer from unexpected uh, financial losses or injury from operating unsafe vehicles that should never have been repaired or will resell them uh, the unsafe vehicle to other unsuspecting consumers in an effort to recoup their loss uh, from having purchased a vehicle that should never have been given a clean title. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for these reasons, uh, I respectfully ask that you, you vote favorably for this bill. Uh, restore transparency and honesty to the state's titling system for these types of vehicles and eliminate this, this titling loophole. Um, thank you again thank you for guys. your uh, time. I appreciate it. Are there any questions from the committee? Representative Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick clarifying question for the author, just trying to track here. On line 1.20, you don't strike the late model or high value. Was there a reason for that? Representative Kosnick. Um, let me take a look at that one second, Madam Chair. Maybe. I wonder if Mr. Burris um, would check, yep, take perhaps a look at Mr. that Burris. as well. Does that look like an oversight? Uh, Possibly. See what Mr. Burris uh, uh, Representative, or Mr. Burris, sorry. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and members, so I guess that's a, that's a, a policy question for the, for the author and, and, and the legislature. <coughs> the um, provision being referred to there refers to uh, situations where the uh, owner of the vehicle is self-insured. And so the, the change as, uh, as introduced for this uh, house style applies to um, when insurers uh, acquire ownership of a vehicle or when a, a person has acquired ownership okay. of, of, a, of a vehicle with an out-of-state title. So this is, uh, you know, this paragraph C is another scenario um, that, uh, you know, in the, in the bill language is still narrowed to the late model and high value vehicles that um, exceed a, a damage threshold. Mm -hmm. So that's Representative Iwakim. So, Mr. Burris, does that, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Burris, does that mean um, more owner to owner sales versus dealer sales? Mr. Burris? Um, Madam Chair, Representative Joachim, I'm not all that up on the scenarios where somebody would be self insured and um, would be required or not required to, to get a salvage title under this. Um, I'd, I'd have to dig into that further. To Thank you, just wondering. So, um, uh, yeah, it sounds like something to, uh, to explore a little bit, but it does sound like a little different um, Madam part Chair, of the law. Uh, my yeah, testifier passing. may be able to address that question a little bit more. All right, Mr. Fisk. The, the self-insured owner might be a corporation that, uh, you know, they don't have a policy. They just, um, uh, they self-insure their own vehicles. 
um, it could be a corporation <laughs> that has their own fleet of vehicles. Representative Joachim. Thank you, Madam Chair. But they could, they could still go by not getting a salvage tail and selling those vehicles. You could still have an unwitting customer or consumer buying that. Uh, Mr. Um, Fisk. Uh, well, if if the vehicle sustains damage, they may decide they don't want to get rid of the vehicle, uh, or um, uh, there might be a variety of reasons where uh, they wouldn't want to change the title. I mean, not that they're getting rid of the vehicle, but it sustained damage. But since they they insure the vehicles themselves, they may not want to apply for a new title. Rips and Kosnick, I mean, <laughs> perhaps you can talk to. Uh, you know, some other sources perhaps and just get a better sense of what that's trying to do and you Absolutely. know maybe maybe that is a, another place to strike yeah we can take a look at that madam chair and uh, representative you if you have some additional information we can be happy to work with you on that and get a little bit more information uh, on that yeah. happy to we do like closing loopholes around here so <laughs> <laughs> thank you representative Kosnick um, and uh, seeing no further questions uh, were there other testifiers anyone in the audience uh, looks like we do have, okay. <coughs> Welcome, Ms. Haas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Nancy Haas with Messerly and Kramer, here representing um, insurance auto auctions. IAA is a leading salvage auction company with a sizable uh, facility footprint, strong buyer base, and high auction returns. Their exclusive focus on the automobile total loss industry in over 150 corporate owned facilities across the US and Canada. They provide sellers and buyers with the best solution to process and acquire total loss, recovered theft, fleet lease, dealer trade-in and collision damage rental vehicles. This bill makes a significant change to Minnesota's motor vehicle salvage law that would have unintended and versed financial consequences for automobile owners uh, who would be required to have a salvage uh, designation on their vehicle and could adversely impact consumers. As a general rule, when a vehicle is involved in an accident and sustains damage that exceeds 75% of the market value of the vehicle, the consumer's insurance company decides to declare, that, to declare that vehicle a total loss vehicle. Insurance companies settle those total loss claims based on their fair market value of the vehicle before the accident, the estimated cost of repairs, and then the estimated salvage value. Oftentimes the vehicle remains roadworthy or um, safe for use and the owner may decide to retain and continue driving the vehicle. If the damages are significant or the owner um, chooses not to keep the vehicle, the insurance company will settle the insurance claim by paying the owner the fair market value of the vehicle and then subsequently have the title transported to an auction facility that specializes in selling damaged vehicles to either repair facility or parts dismantler. Minnesota law currently requires such insurance total loss vehicles less than six years old or those older that are considered a high value vehicle, which is in excess of $9,000 before the damage, to be branded as salvage title. The other total loss vehicles are not re required to have a salvage title. The current six year plus high value salvage rule require, recognizes the practical reality that newer vehicles with their higher fair market values will have significant damage in order to cause the total loss. In contrast, older, older vehicles are more likely to be declared total loss even when roadworthy because the repair cost for the minor damages can easily exceed 75% of the low fair market value. House file 3528 changes the law by eliminating the six year plus high value salvage requirement. And so every vehicle that is designated a total loss by an insurer will be classified as salvage regardless of whether the damage is structural or cosmetic, even if the vehicle remains roadworthy. Today, the average vehicle on the road is more than 11 years old. The unintended challenge for consumers will be especially apparent with the older model vehicles. An owner of such an older model vehicle will face the burden and expense of an anti-theft inspection, inspection, excuse me, to or, in order to obtain a title, which title will then be branded. Anytime such consumer sells the vehicle, the amount they receive for the car will be significantly reduced simply because the bill requires um, that such vehicles be branded with the salvage title designation. 
Likewise, insurance company recoveries for the sale of salvage vehicles will re would be reduced and could act as an insurance rate cost driver that could result in higher insurance costs for consumers. The majority of states provide exemption from salvage designation on vehicle titles based on age and or damage threshold, and this bill is eliminating that. Because of these concerns, Insurance Auto Auction opposes the bill as written. However, we do appreciate the author's openness and the proponent's openness to further dialogue to see if agreement can be reached on the topic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Haas. So um, I wonder, we, uh, we, well, there's some other, there looks like there's some other testifiers. Sorry. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair and committee members, uh, Bob Johnson, Insurance Federation of Minnesota. My members write a majority of the private passenger personal auto sold in the state, and I have to apologize to the chief author for not visiting with them before this, but I did visit briefly with the, uh, some representatives of LKQ. Uh, and really what I, I would like to just express some concerns. I'll categorize it as that in terms of the legislation and, and just make a couple of points. We do see uh, there is gonna be some increase and volume in terms of the title processing from the auto insurer's perspective. I have found that many of my members today in Minnesota as a matter of business practice do what this bill requires. So they're actually not changing their practices. I, I can't tell you what all of them are doing, but many do it because a number of other states do it. And frankly, it does simplify the process uh, by handling it that way. And as I said, it does align with, with what a number of other states do, not all of them. So I think from, from our perspective, those are uh, some of the, the key comments to make. I think that I would add that an especially large concern is this change being done in the context of the Minlars situation in our state. And we've testified, seems to be two or three hearings a day on Minlars, but, uh, and, and probably for some good reasons from, from our industry's perspective too, that, that uh, increasing the volume <laughs> of the work in the context of what's going on at Minlar is it may be, and I just throw this out, you may want to consider kind of delaying the effective date of this because, uh, because of that increased volume, and I know we're all still anxiously awaiting the les legislative resolution, but if the timetable of Minlar's is two years out, or whatever the numbers I know that have been, that are being talked about, that uh, we may want to consider doing that. I think I would just add and, and echo just lastly a couple of comments. Minnesota has been viewed as a favored state for title washing, identified as such. So I think the testimony about uh, dealing with that, I agree with that. And a number of states are reacting to that because of these volumes of cars, surely the floods down in Texas uh, typify that. So, so we do need to do a better job and I think this is a plus in dealing with the title washing phenomenon. But as Ms. Haas commented, there are some legitimate issues about these owner retained <coughs> salvage, particularly low value and kind of the negative impact on some families that choosing to, that's the vehicle they've got. And so I think there's some negative impact mm -hmm. there that, that uh, is just frankly a byproduct of moving to the system. So that's, and I have other comments on the, the, the titling process, but that actually doesn't fit this bill. I, I think it would be prudent as we go forward to continue to look at, and as part of the Minlar system, this whole notion of stamping, and uh, st I don't even know if stamping continues under Minlar's, it shouldn't continue. Stamping is a, it has been a pretty unique phenomenon about what states do and most don't do it. You don't wanna do it because that invites title washing, that whole notion of stamping. It, it, it ought to be part of a data field and a computer system so you can't do the kind of tampering that you can do with stamps. But that's a little a feel from the, this bill, so I don't, but, but it kind of fits in a discussion about it. So I mean, I'm sure and committee members, those were the comments that I wanted to supply in the bill and I, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for sharing, uh, sharing your wisdom with us. It's I know this the subject always is uh, more complicated than it seems, this salvage stuff, so. But uh, Representative Kosnick, so um, I think we should go ahead. I think we can move the bill and move it to the general register as planned, uh, but obviously there's some ongoing maybe conversation, so. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I would renew my motion to uh, encourage you to, to vote for the bill. I, I don't know if I, a motion's uh, required there, but. Um, as November, uh, as early as no, or last November, 
2017, Kerr Levin did a story uh, highlighting that Minnesota cars six years and older, worth $9,000 or less, can get a clean title no matter how badly damaged. So unlike salvage vehicles, they don't need to be inspected, rebuilt, and re uh, before being rebuilt and resold. So what this bill does is provide consumers protection that if they choose to buy a vehicle that has had some damage that they know about it up front, uh, some people may be concerned with that on their title because it'll lower the cost of their product. And I think, you know, that's just a, a market consequence, but I think consumers should be well informed when they purchase a vehicle. Uh, if it, they're getting such a good deal, there's a reason why, and it is because the vehicle may have sustained damage, and that's what this bill does is close uh, those loopholes. So uh, I request that you vote in favor of this bill. So Representative Kosnick has re renewed his motion to re-refer House File 3528 to the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. No. no. The motion prevails. All right, um, and up next we have House File 3514. Representative Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you could help me, I'm not sure where I'm moving or if we're laying over the file. Representative Barr, we're going to move the bill and re refer it to Government Operations Committee. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Members and Madam Chair, this bill prohibits the Met Council from advertising an activity. And Representative, as, why don't we just make sure we mention it's House File 3514. Thank you. And going to government operations. And going to government operations. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this bill would prohibit the Met Council from advertising an activity as a service of the council. And instead it would have to indicate it's paid for with taxpayer dollars. In addition, it creates more clarity around how the Met Council may use public money as it relates to advocacy. And so I'll start with the, pers the first part of the bill. And uh, in February, excuse me, January of 2017, I happened to stop at a uh, traffic light and the light rail went by. And I happened to notice that it said it was a service of the Met Council, which was a little bit surprising to me because when I have looked at other um, branding that comes out from the state. Um, I hadn't seen something that was specific to an organization like the Met Council. And uh, I have to say it irritated me to see that because I believe in transparency and also in truth in advertising. And prior to owning, starting my own company 15 years ago, I was a marketing executive and we had to do a lot of footnoting and making sure that we were clear in our advertising um, to consumers. So I feel that um, if we really want to have some truth in advertising, we should be telling our citizens that the um, Metro Mobility and the Metro Transit are actually paid by taxpayer dollars. So that's the first part of the bill. Um, the second part of the bill really gets into uh, how funds can be used um, in terms of advocacy. And I think there's a big difference between you know, making PSA announcements oh. about services and launching a campaign using public dollars to actually um, work to advocate against things that may be moving through the legislature. And you do have some articles in your packet, I believe, that focus on that. And so a campaign was launched, um, I think somewhat erroneously, given what we know that came out of the Office of um, the Legislative Auditor, where reports were coming out that the Met Council was going to be having a deficit and um, that we were looking to uh, cut funding and they held public hearings um, to basically work against um, some of what we were d discussing at the legislature, talking about fare hikes. They had web postings. Um, one of the postings had a title that said, proposed budget cuts will devastate Twin Cities Transit. Um, um, they had articles and things that were being published saying that what we were doing was even mean-spirited. So I think there's a big difference between doing appropriate advocacy work and launching an all-out marketing and advertising campaign against something. And that was um, why I thought it was important to bring that forward. I also know that we do have some members that had received calls in their district specifically from the Met Council threatening that their um, services would be eliminated. And so um, that's 
basically the I think the heart of what we're trying to do with this bill and Madam Chair I'm happy to stand for questions thank you representative okay I think uh, we have um, <coughs> oh, representative Mason why don't we go with you and then I think mr. Shetton wishes to thank you madam chair statements. I guess I'm gonna uh, take issue first of all with the sign I mean if you see something that's paid with tax dollars I mean, that's pretty broad. I mean, if you see something that says uh, Met Council or the City of Egan or whatever, I mean, that, you, that at least gives you a place to go to. And that, to me, would be an important thing. Tax, I mean, tax dollars, I, don't, I, I guess I just totally don't understand the part, your, your part one. Did you want to respond, Representative? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Mason. I think with all the conversations that we've had around the Met Council um, over the past many months in terms of the overreach of this organization, I think the fact that um, the Met Council has two separate brands, being one being the Metro Transit and one being the Metro Mobility, uh, really is telling. And the fact then they have another brand called Met Council and so I respectfully disagree. I think that we should be telling um, our constituents and riders um, that this service is being paid with their money. And you think that they don't know Representative that? Representative Mason. I'm sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. And you think that the general public doesn't know that the Met Council is using taxpayers' money? Representative Barr. Madam Chair I, and Representative, I would hazard a guess and that they do not. Okay, uh, Mr. Shetnan. Great, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Please give us your name and for the record. And members, I'm Judd Shetnan with the uh, Metropolitan Council, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to House File 3514. <coughs> and I did have a chance to speak with Representative Barr about this yesterday, and conversed. Uh, I guess sent her an email earlier this morning with some um, information about how the council was going to respond to this. And I I do agree with Representative Barr that it is important to be transparent and accountable and uh, we feel the, co the council has that same responsibility and we think that by re actually removing the tagline that says the service of the Metropolitan Council would reduce that transparency and accountability. Um, Representative Barr is right. Uh, Metro Transit and Metro Mobility are both brands of the council and that's why we think carrying that tagline that says it is a service provided by the Metropolitan Council shows folks who is ultimately responsible for that? And it is the council. There isn't a, there isn't a, a board or a body that oversees uh, Metro Transit separately or, or Metro Mobility separately. It is the Metropolitan Council and our council members and our chair. Um, additionally, on your on your property tax statement, at least if you're in a Metro member, there is a line there that says the Metropolitan Council, and in there that is important for us to make sure that the taxpayers who are reading that line when they are out about they're able to see if they see one of our trains or they see a bus or they see a transit link vehicle or they see a they're at a bus shelter or or a metro mobility vehicle they're able to identify the fact that them that they through their property tax are able to see where that taxpayer dollar is going is going and i think that it is just doing the opposite of making sure that they're would not be accountability because people wouldn't know who is responsible for that. And in this case, at both Metro Transit and Metro Mobility and all of the other providers, it is uh, a service of the council. On our Metro Council Environmental Services vehicles that we use at our wastewater treatment plants, it says MCES. It doesn't say a service of the Metropolitan Council because it is the Metropolitan Council. These Those brands are separate and that's why we, again, are saying that we um, think that it actually takes away transparency and it takes away accountability. Now, regarding section two of the bill, we are, are very concerned about that, uh, about that language. Um, for instance, if, if this bill were to move forward, it would not allow the council to support an initiative or a funding increase recommended by the governor, uh, even though the council is a member of the governor's cabinet and our parks and transit funds are included in the governor's budget recommendations to the to the legislature. So we wouldn't be able to speak to that if this bill were to move forward. 
The bill still also states that the council cannot use public money to assert there'll be a reduction in service from a proposed legislative action with the purpose of asking the members of the public to oppose those proposals. And just to stop there for a second, I can tell you that I cannot think of one instance, and I've been at the Metropolitan Council for almost 18 years. I can't think of an instance where there's been anybody from the Met Council who has called a member of the legislature telling them to oppose something. If they were doing that, they were doing that on their own time. That does not happen at the Met Council as far as I know. And I cannot imagine, and we have never once told any of our staff to reach out to a member to oppose something. That is not work, that is not how it works. It is not in our policies. Those activities flow through me. So that is that I can't and Representative Barr, if that has happened, I apologize for that and that is not how we operate. Um, I do believe it is important for the public to understand that bills like last year's omnibus transportation finance bill that that has a that had a hundred and twenty two million dollar reduction in our biennial budget that would potentially reduce our service by about 40% is important for people to know. We provide over 100 million regional rides through our LRT, our bus, our Metro Mobility, the suburban transit providers, and through TransitLink throughout the region. And there are many folks who are calling and asking us what are the impacts of these bills. And we think that it is important to make sure that folks know that, that, is a, that what those impacts are. Those are also outlined in the fiscal notes that you request and in the letters that we submit to the committee chairs as the budget process uh, goes through its process. And that is just part of the process. Um, last thing I want to say here is that I'm not aware of any other proposed legislation that would restrict other governmental entities, state government, regional government, or local government. And I'm not sure why the Met Council is, be, is being uh, singled out here. But um, I think that what this bill does is actually reduces transparency and accountability for all of us. And for that reason, we oppose the bill. <clears throat> so, um, so Mr. Shetton and I, we have a few, quite a few people want to comment, but um, I think there is a fine line and maybe it's one to work on, but um, between outright political advocacy um, that is meant to scare people based maybe on, on, on information that isn't proper properly understood. So I think that was a situation very unique last spring that I think all of us dealt with, um, you know, and, well, and had to confront as a, as a part of the activities of budgeting for, for the Met Council. Well, Madam Chair, just to respond to one of the things you just said is that it might not have been properly understood. That is why we think we need to have more transparency and make sure people understand what this is. I mean, when we sent our letter to the chair last year it was based off of a conversation we had with the committee's fiscal analyst to make sure that we had the numbers right and that the reduction was $122 million. We received $89.8 .8 million of general fund. This was more than a, than a year's worth of our general fund that was being reduced. And so to make sure that people properly understand what is included in these bills, we were responding to that. Uh, I see Representative Hurtas, did you have a comment? I did. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Barr. I wanted to uh, comment with regard to the advocacy part. We've, we've heard uh, Mr. Chetnam uh, testify that they don't, um, you know, direct their uh, employees to advocate for uh, positions with regard to the legislature, but um, we clearly had uh, circumstances where they advocated to constituents that they serve to advocate against the policies of the legislature. And I had uh, quite a, a detailed uh, follow-up and effort uh, trying to track down through the constituent who was threatened that their Metro Mobility rides were going to be cut because Metro Council staff told those individual customers who were really relying on Metro Mobility that uh, the positions of the legislature were going to cut by 40% uh, the ability for them to have access to rides. That's my understanding, uh, and you can correct me, Mr. Chutnam, if I'm incorrect, but the mandate you have of Metro Mobility is in statute by the federal government. I think the dollars that you get uh, from the Fed are really uh, priority one for Metro Mobility. I think there are other things the Met Council does when you start talking about cutting things that are more discretionary than that which you're mandated to do, whether it's unfunded or funded, 
uh, or not. So now I'm a little bit troubled by uh, the bookkeeping that the Met Council has done and, and the claims that uh, they've made, and maybe it's fair, maybe it's unfair that a constituent calls and complains to their representative that Met Council staff are telling me as a customer that I'm not going to be able to get a ride anymore. That certainly seems like advocacy to me as a legislator, and I resent very much uh, that kind of communication coming from uh, constituents uh, being fed a line of crap, really, uh, by, by your staff. Uh, it's, uh, it's unnecessary, it's needless, and uh, there's plenty of money within the Met Council to take care of Metro Mobility. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, and Representative Hurtas, I, I, I appreciate your comments, Representative Hurtas, and at the end of last session, you and I actually had a conversation um, about this, and what we were able to do is make sure that our folks in our uh, Metro Mobility office uh, we're aware that in no way people are supposed to be advocating or uh, extending an opinion uh, in that manner. But uh, related to the Metro Mobility Service, you are correct that we have a federal mandate that we have to provide that service. However, the council actually goes beyond uh, that, that, um, that mandated area and provides additional service with additional hours of service in areas that are not within that um, federally mandated service area. So there may have been impacts, and in fact, there would have been impacts uh, based on that, but uh, I appreciate your comments with that, and I promise you that we will continue to have this conversation with our staff about what so uh, people are supposed to be. If we could, be. we wanna have some other comments, Mr. Shutnan, so. Okay. Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, Mr. Shetnan uh, made a number of the points I wanted to make, but I wanted to give the, uh, the committee a little bit of historical perspective on this. Uh, I was on the council uh, when this uh, decision was made to say a service of the Metropolitan Council, I believe on the, the bus vehicles at that time. I think it was Council Member Summers from Plymouth. I, I have a very clear memory of this meeting. Uh, so it must have been in 2001 or 2002. And her point was exactly this, that we wanted transparency. No one knew what you know who was funding who was involved in, in in metro transit it is a service it is a part of the met council when we're talking about uh governance and i uh you know share concerns about that but i'll tell you uh that is not clear to the general public that the transit system is run by the council and it's not necessarily clear and there's there's very similar signage on the suburban transit systems so um, this is exactly as Mr. Shetland said. This is a this is transparency. We go in the opposite direction. We say fund uh, funded by taxpayers. You know where does it end? We have to have a sign on the state office building funded by taxpayers. Every rest area funded by taxpayers. Every school funded by taxpayers. Every hospital, public hospital funded by taxpayers. Come on. I mean, uh, I think that uh, we're 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 taking. Uh, some concerns a, a, a bit to an extreme here. And, um, uh, you know, it says CTIB on the trains, too, which I think we're going to, I agree with your bill on that, by the way. I mean, it's, we need to, CTIB doesn't exist, so we have to clean it up in statute. But, you know, people didn't realize that, that the counties were funding the light rail system. So this is standard practice, and it is transparency. It's necessary for the public. Now, on the second uh, second issue, um, you know, every agency also has lobbyists, multi even more than the Met Council has in some cases, and so their job is to do public affairs here. And oftentimes, those public affairs professionals are sitting around with advocates and others that have a common interest in their agenda. This is standard practice. So, I, I think we are taking some concerns a bit to the extreme here and singling out the Met Council uh, unfairly. Um, I, I've seen that the, the legislative auditor's report has now been used, uh, I think, uh, I've met, heard a couple of comments to, to justify this. And, and I think that, uh, again, that's taking that report, I think, to a, to a place where it, it's not necessarily um, valid. So, members, I, I strongly oppose this. Um, uh, it's, it's a fa the fact of the matter is Metro Transit is 
a service of the Metropolitan Council. Just as Southwest Transit is a service. You can look at all the transit vehicles. You can look at uh, vehicles that are not transit vehicles that are owned by the state that have similar indications and signage and license plates. So once we open up this can of worms, folks, I think we're going to have a lot of signs around the state uh, that are unnecessary and um, I, I, I hope we'll all vote this down. Representative New. Madam Chair, could I make a comment just um, before we move Representative forward? Representative Barr. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And so I've heard both Representative Hornstein and Mr. Shetnan reference um, and compare the Met Council to an agency. And I just want to state for the record that they are not an agency and they are not a body of elected officials. And for that reason, I think transparency as to who is actually paying for it is even more important. So I just want us to comment on that because I keep hearing agency get thrown around. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Barr, or, I'm sorry, Representative New. That's all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Shetnan, and I'm wondering if you can give us some idea of both what your budget is for out of the Met Council for advocacy, um, and that, and I would define advocacy as things like fair changes, um, things that are important functions that that might be important information for, for your users to know and an idea of what your budget is for that and, and some idea of what your plan is for that just for fiscal years 17, 18, assuming you budget similarly to the legislature. Mr. Shannon. Um, Madam Chair and Representative, uh, we actually just raised fares. Um, mm -hmm. uh, went into effect October 1st, so I can find out what the budget was. Um, there's a federal process that we have to follow when we when we do this, and so um, I can find out what that was, but I I don't know that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, may I follow up? Representative, no. <laughs> um, and 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 in addition to that, I mean, I'd I'd love to hear more broadly what that is, as opposed to just related to these fair changes. What your overall plan is, and and uh, and budget is for those advocacy changes, and I'd also be interested to know. Um, more on the marketing side of things as as well, um, what your budget is and what your plan is and, and how that functions. Sure. Um, and and Madam Mr. Chair, Chair, maybe we can take those, you know, we could perhaps get some information back from you. Exactly. And, and get that, that would be great. Representative New, if that would be all right. That would be fine with me. All right. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, to the bill author, Representative Barr, I guess my question is to section two. How do you intend to police what asserting to the public is? Say, can Met Council come and testify at a public hearing about how a legislative proposal may affect their budget? And then in um, the 1.2, 1 or 1.12, 1.13, um, are we going to then be limiting Met Council staff to only say, positive things about legislative proposals? Representative Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Cagle. Um, since others have referenced these agencies, I would say let's look to the best practices of what the agencies are currently doing and take a look at what Met Council is doing. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Joaquim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Representative Barr, I can understand the transparency um, and where, where you might be trying to go with this bill. Under the advocacy part, I'd maybe suggest you look at how we craft what school boards can do and districts can do when it comes to school levies. Um, it's a lot more clean and clear of how, because I feel that this is, a, as Representative Cagle just pointed out, this is vague and a little extreme. Um, with school districts, they're told you can provide the facts. And I believe, honestly, what, um, Mr. Shetland is saying, I think they provided the facts and the advocates and the business community is one of the articles you just pointed out, chambers of commerce and transit advocates are the ones rallying and spreading the word because they were provided with the facts. And what, those, what the other groups do after those facts are provided is up to them. So uh, the language that you can look at with how school districts can advocate or not advocate for bond and levy referendums, you might want to look at that to like narrow it down a little bit. Um, and I do believe in transparency and making sure. And what they're saying in these signs is that they're the ones operating it because they are the ones operating it. And you can look at this, you know, look at some of the Southwest Transit or Plymouth Link or Maple Grove, the opt-outs. 
that's taxpayer dollars too. So should we be adding that to their signs? Maybe we should. Folks should know, that's our tax dollars. And I, I didn't want to go into this and get really creative with amendments because I didn't want to waste the committee's time. But as a local official for nine years sitting there and seeing our fire and police departments being fully funded by our taxpayer dollars and wanting to put a sign outside Hopkins saying you are now traveling into a city that's fully funded by you and we're getting nothing from the state. So I mean you could take this to an extreme that way. You could, you know, every county road, every road outside of the metropolitan area, you could say 65% of this road was paid for six, by 65% of Hennepin County taxpayer dollars, because it is. So I'm just saying kind of be a little bit careful with your language up here when it comes to that, because I think this is overly broad and extreme and really curtailing some of that stuff. Um, and then I have a personal request of uh, Chairman Runbeck. I really respect the way you run your committee and how fair you are and balanced. I know a lot of us are really passionate about these subjects up here when it comes to the Met Council on both sides. And I promise to control my language. If you can just make sure that you're not letting members say things like fed a line of crap at the committee table, I'd greatly appreciate it. You know, Representative Hurtas, I do respect you too. So I'm just asking to maybe keep the decorum a little bit. Thank you. So mm -hmm. All righty. Um, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and kind of along the same lines uh, there, I also do appreciate the passion and and the willingness to really to kind of support Met Council because it is a, an important uh, project and, and service for people that really need our the mobility that it's here. But and and I also, uh, Mr. Shetton, and this question is for you, and it's going to be a brief because I think what you said is a actually true. The Met Council is an agency, or it is it is part of the cabinet of the governor. After the governor does does um, uh, you know appoint all of the people that are on it. In that regard, the question to you is, do you believe that the Met Council has uh, handled how it supports various legislation in the same manner that all the other agencies and programs that are part of the cabinet of the governor does? Uh, because there are some restrictions and limitations on how that, that happens. Um, Madam Mr. Chair Stanton. and Representative Petersburg, um, that's kind of a tough question, but I would tell you that how we communicate with the uh, committees uh, that we deal with, the tax committee, the transportation committee, policy, finance, the environment committees, legacy committees, all of the committees that we kind of touch, uh, we communicate with those uh, committees similar to the way that MnDOT does. We would send a letter that would explain the um, issues that we either support or don't support as part of a budget setting process. I know that our chair would submit that letter similar to the uh, Commissioner of Transportation would or the Commissioner of Public Safety uh, would in those, um, in those situations. Um, so I think that we are relatively consistent. One of the things that Representative Barr and I talked about yesterday is that the council, you're right, is not a, is not a state agency. We're a local government. Uh, but we are also a, um, appointed by the governor and the governor recommends his, the, the, the budgets uh, for or transit and uh, parks and um, uh, the regional parks and legacy funds through that uh, budget process. And so we operate, Representative Petersburg, to your point, or to your question, I think very similar to how um, those sta other state agencies would, uh, would do that. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry, sorry, follow up. Oh. Uh, thank you, and I should have been clear. Uh, in regards to public uh, dissemination in which, you know, letters like you send out to the public, I, I really refer to that because I, I know that real, when it comes to legislative committees, you are uh, uh, proper, but my concern is how you disseminate um, negative or positive information to the public is, is my concern. Right, and Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg, I um. I don't know uh, what letters that we disseminate to the public other than the letters that we submit to the committee chairs. I cannot think of a campaign that we have done related to a public campaign related to uh, the, um, the, the funding bills. As um, was mentioned earlier by someone, it might have been Representative Joachim, I know that the Chamber of Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce or some of the um, Advocacy groups uh, have done similar type, um, similar type, uh, or an advocacy campaign related to that. But uh, uh, if you would like to speak to the um, the letter that we presented to the committee, 
that's where we're at. And I see representative um, that they're passing around a letter. Maybe there is one. If you'd like to show me that, that would be fine. But I, uh, Madam Chair and, and members of the committee, we communicate, um, like I mentioned earlier, through the letters that we send to the, the committees and through the presentations that we provide to the committees and also the information that's included in the fiscal notes that are uh, requested by the legislature. And so that's where that information is, is handled and then we talk about it in the same ways, the same process that we do with the legislature every year when we try to debate and put forward a budget. Right, um, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I think it's a good discussion that is uh, important to have. I appreciate the different comments on both sides of the aisle about this. Um, and I, I guess, Mr. Shetnan, just as a point, the, you and I have worked together in the past on a couple bills, uh, especially last year. I was somebody that was kind of fighting on my side for uh, the bus funding, and I was a recipient of somebody not from the from the Met Council, but somebody from a different chamber just out of the blue came down into my district campaigning at my bus stop to our constituents talking about how horrible uh, our, our bill was. Uh, and in fact, I, my intention was to be there within 24 hours without knowing that they were coming there to tell them that I was fighting for additional funding for that particular route. And so that's something I didn't appreciate. I know that it wasn't specifically a Met Council person, but the point of the discussion here today, I think that needs to be noted, is that in your communications, that will have an effect on the other agent uh, groups uh, advocating for it. And I, I recognize that it was not the Met Council. I don't think there's a <laughs> need for you to reply, but no, very seriously, it, well, I was working on the behalf of something that we were working on together with the Met Council, and I didn't appreciate having advocacy groups in my district uh, saying things that weren't true about my position on the Met Council. Well, Madam okay. Chair and Representative Kosnick, I, um, that was not organized by the Metropolitan Council. I didn't say it was, and, sure. And the information that is provided, and that was a bill, I believe, that some of the advocacy groups were bringing forward related to the bill that the committee actually passed. And so I don't, I can't control that. So, the advocacy groups do that. Maybe the chambers do it. I'm not sure who's doing that. But I just want to make it clear to the committee that that is not being conducted or the strings pulled by the Metropolitan Council because that is not the case. Well, I, I, you know, just maybe to summarize is um, what all that went on, went down last spring over budgeting, I think is, you know, flaring back up and a little bit of, uh, you know, per perhaps uh, correct animosity here that we, you know, we don't need to have those kinds of public mm -hmm. fights and uh, we should be should be able to do the business better. Um, Representative Bernardi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, what's going through my mind is like free speech. We're now talking about groups and about what they're saying and like holding the Met Council responsible for people's free speech. And, um, you know, I don't really like the idea of a gag rule. If this was something that was, uh, if this was something that was, a, you came here and you were applying an equal weight to all the other transit agencies in the state, it might be more, um, I don't even know if, I wouldn't be more palatable to me, but be more sincere in trying to, they use slogans, they, um, they do things similar to the Met Council. And I don't think that we actually, I don't think we should um, be afraid of public disclosure, of what the decisions that are being made here at the Capitol and for the public to know them. And if that's how the, they respond to them and it's gonna affect your community, and. Thank you for sticking up for your community. That's what we're all here to do. It wasn't gonna affect, it wasn't gonna affect your community? Okay. Well, anyway, thank you for fighting for people who uh, need transit and for our state who needs transit so that we have a robust transportation system where people wanna move here and build their businesses. So anyway, I'm really concerned about free speech, gag rule, and about public being afraid of public disclosure. So I, I oppose this bill for these, those reasons. And we have um, some one uh, additional person who wishes to make a comment. Maybe they'll shed some more uh, insight onto that. Shannon Watson. Yeah. Welcome, Ms. Watson. Good evening. Please give us your name for the record, please. Thank you. For the record, my name is Shannon Watson. I am the Director of Public Affairs for the St. Paul Area Chamber. Um, for the record, I've also been on this job since the end of October, 
So I wasn't part of that other thing. <laughs> Very good. Good to clarify. Just, just, prefacing, just prefacing any questions. So I wasn't there. Um, you have received a letter signed by the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, and East Metro Strong. Together, these three organizations represent over 2,700 companies and organizations that employ more than 500,000 people in the region. Our three organizations are opposed to this bill, which would ban the Met Council from informing the public about the impact of proposed legislation on the region's transit system. Such a ban would limit access to important information that allows the public, businesses, and policymakers at all levels, including cities and counties, to fully understand how proposed legislative action would affect the hundreds of thousands of people who use transit. Last year, we were able to engage with our members when the legislator proposed fund funding cuts that would negatively have impacted transit. Getting facts from the Met Council about the impact of the proposed cuts was important to our work. The public should be fully informed about measures the legislature considers so they can let their elected representatives know about impacts and unintended consequences. Cutting off information from the organization that works directly on this issue would lead to confusion and misinformation and an inability for us to share the facts with people who need them, including our members. For, for these reasons, we oppose this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The, uh, did you well, I, we have one more comment. I mean, we've probably gone on too long about this, but Representative Whalen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I just was uh, thinking about quite a few things. Uh, thank you, Representative Barr, for bringing the bill. Um, I don't know if uh, the, ch uh, the chair was still here. Uh, I just wanted to comment or clarify some things that I heard. There was some comments um, about how the council mm -hmm. um, indicating whether or not a particular activity is paid for with tax dollars. And just to be clear, the bill says the council may indicate, not the council shall indicate. So to me, that says if the council wants to state that a service is gonna be provided, um, they can indicate that, but they don't have to. So we're not saying that every uh, street has to say this is paid for with taxpayer dollars, every school, et cetera. Um, also, just a point on that, I'm thinking to myself, if a school wanted to say, uh, you know, this service is provided by, well, my question would be who provides the dollars? Um, and so this is actually a question for the chair. Um, who, how would you define provision of services? Is it the funding, um, because if you're upset that the legislature is reducing your funding and claiming that will reduce your services, that to me says actually then the legislature's funding is in, at the very least in part providing these services. Whelan, I, I think what we're gonna do with the bill is, is lay it over for possible inclusion. And I think there's a number of, of sort of subtle things that maybe would be clarified in that process. And so if that's okay, we could just, um, you know, do some work and, uh, and listen to all these voices and see how we can tighten the bill up, if that's okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess then I'll just end the, uh, with the comment of thank you, uh, Representative Barr, for bringing the bill. I think it's wonderful when uh, members get inspired to do something. And I think there are ways that we can work to make this um, an improvement because as you indicated, the Met Council is a very unique entity. And so I think it calls for unique governance of the legislature in this legislation. And uh, very short, Representative Hurtas, very short comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Mr. Uh, Chutnam, I, I wanna direct my uh, comments directly to you. Um, I know that you're not the Met Council and I know you're uh, a man of integrity that, that uh, comes to do your job in terms of uh, advocating for the policies of the Met Council. But what I do wanna say, and part of the frustration that I certainly expressed, is a frustration that uh, is deep and inherent amongst local government that you have jurisdiction over. And this has been a situation that's been going on for decades with regard to the Met Council. And particularly the, the resistance of uh, really listening to the uh, communities and uh, communities having to follow the mandates and the directives, Sorry. particularly in the arena of uh, comprehensive planning. So if I was unstatesmanlike, uh, I apologize to you with regard to the frustration that, that I expressed, but um, the Met Council's got a great deal of uh, image problem with amongst local officials. This has gone on for decades and um, 
uh, you know, the, the tension is high amongst local officials and those of us who served as local officials and serve in a capacity at the state government. We uh, uh, clearly have a frustration and uh, want to do something about it. So thank you, sir. All right, and members, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. So um, Representative Barr, I'm going to change the motion. Um, we're gonna take House File 3514 and lay it over for possible inclusion. And um, is there, let's see. To, yeah, so if uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Oh, we don't have to? Oh, we don't have to. I'm sorry, we don't have to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Barr. Okay. All right. Um, and we're going to, um, I know there are people who've been waiting long and we apologize. Um, I am going to ask the, that we do 3346, which I think I should be a fairly quick bill, mm -hmm. which is the Como Bridge bill. All right, great. Uh, next we have House File 3346. I will move to bring House File 3346 before the committee and that it be re-referred to the Committee on Transportation Finance. And go ahead and introduce the bill, Chair Rumbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And House File 3346, um, it deals with the uh, uh, the MnDOT's Department of, of uh, Freight Rail, okay, and uh, and this is a representative of the Minnesota Commercial. It's a short line railroad. They don't own lines, they lease lines, and so when it comes to tracks or when it comes to bridges that are railroad bridges, uh, they're really not in a position to, to borrow, uh, but if, the, if repairs need to, need to be done, uh, they need help, and so this is a Como Avenue bridge that had to be repaired, was really in, a, in bad shape, and so they were able to uh, get some money as a loan on a loan, right? But I will let you explain it. Um, so MnDOT has been involved with a loan, but at this point we are asking for that converted, mm -hmm. to be converted to a, a grant. Okay, so there is a testifier. If you could introduce yourself to the committee and for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Wayne Hall. I'm Chief Operating Officer of the Minnesota Commercial Railway. Uh, the bridge that we're talking about is on Como Avenue, over Como Avenue, just west of Highway 280. This bridge was discovered in 2014 to have uh, significant deficiencies. Um, we took it upon ourselves to do immediate repairs to the bridge for the public safety, uh, the traveling public underneath and the roadway and the operation of the trains. Um, once the immediate repairs were done, we, we started the process of um, getting funding for this bridge. We're a small company. We have approximately 90 employees. Uh, we service 80 local industries from uh, Minneapolis to Fridley to Hugo. Um, approximately 69,000 rail cars go over this bridge every year. Uh, so the repairs that had to be done were a very significant amount of money for our company. Um, the estimate was approaching $400,000. Uh, we did not have that, so we went to the state of Minnesota, MnDOT, and uh, at that time we were able to acquire a 10-year no-interest loan. Um, we have letters of support. Um, from uh, the Minnesota uh, Midway Chamber of Commerce, the St. Paul Chamber of Commerce, and uh, almost all the customers affected by this line that uh, they believe that loan forgiveness on this segment is, is reasonable. Um, this bridge was built in 1936 under contract between the state of Minnesota the city of St. Paul and the railroad at the time was the Minnesota Transfer Railway. Um, the money for this was from uh, federal government under the work program at that time. Uh, 
as Linda said, this, this bridge uh, does not show ownership. Uh, there's various bridges on our railroad that do show ownership, such as uh, the bridge over 694, 35W, uh, University Avenue, those all show ownership. There is no ownership for this bridge. It's not, it's not documented anywhere. Um, just to make sure that the public was safe, we did the repairs. We were able to uh, receive a loan in the amount of $352,536. Uh, that was uh, funds were distributed to us in November of 2015. Uh, we started making the initial payments on it. Uh, it's $8,813.41 per month. We've made nine payments on it. The current open balance on it is $273,215. Um, like I said, we're a small company and this is a large share of money for us. Um, and I appreciate your support on this bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Um, we have Representative Bernardi. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And is it Mr. Hall? Hall. H A U H A L L. Thank you. And I, I, we went by. We had a meeting together today on another subject, and I was calling him Wayne today. So, Mr. Right. Hall, thank you. It's nice to see you again. A question I do have about this is. Um, regarding the ownership of it, right now you're saying that there's no, nobody owns this? There's no, there's no documentation showing Mr. ownership Howells? of the bridge. I'm sorry. Okay. And so then this is my question. Is this an area at all that anybody, like any city or county, would be interested in having some um, sharing any right away with or doing anything that you would come back and you would say, we own the bridge, you can't do that. I mean, is there anything that in the, the city or the county public, the public interest that would be, um, be important to um, pursue or know about? Mr. Howells? Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Right, because what I, 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 and I think, um, and Mr. Hall was very, um, we had a really good meeting today. I was really proud of the outcome, and it was, I think, a win-win for everybody. We'll be having a bill coming shortly as well. I think that it's important that we make sure we look at if we're putting private dollars into, I mean, public dollars into a private business, that we look at the whole comprehensive stakeholders in that area and how can it be a win-win for everyone. And I want to thank you for um, the meeting that we had today to make that happen. Thank you, Representative Bernardi. Is there anyone else who would wish to testify regarding the bill? Uh, seeing none, I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 3346 to the Transportation Finance Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay, the motion prevails. Thank you. Chair Rumbeck, we will do 3369. House file 3369. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, the, uh, the bill before you is uh, a bill that um, makes some, I think, needed changes uh, to the way that Met Council is preparing and presenting information to the legislature, really dealing with their finances. Um, as anybody who has sat on the commission for uh, the, the legislative commission on metropolitan governance or anyone who has sat um, through sort of a budget sort of session with the Met Council, because it has become very hard to know, really read the numbers in a way that we all can understand. We need a simpler, uh, more transparent format. And so, um, and the, you know, the reason came out of the OLA audit uh, which uh, led us to ask some real serious questions. Um, and we did uh, seek some uh, expertise. Uh, we've got, I think, um, some, a very good bill. But the questions that were, that were raised is, you know, how forthcoming um, has the Met Council been about the assumptions that they make when they put together their projections, um, pro uh, projecting deficits, um, you know, that's a big issue. We, we dealt with that last spring. Uh, do their documents that they present uh, give us the kind of information we need to operate from? 
And so at the first section of the bill, and I think Mr. Lee can speak to that, uh, but it is asking, you know, for a, a format, and I provided a couple examples um, in your packet, but the financial snapshot, for example, that MnDOT provides um, gives you an incredible amount of information uh, where all the sources, the funds, uh, and then it's over about six year period of time. So it's extremely useful. At any rate, if, um, if between Mr. Lee and, and um, Mr. Burris, if they would go through the budgets or the summary, because it will really tell you all the features of the bill. Mr. Lee, if you could walk us through a little bit. Mr. Chair and members, I'll walk through the first uh, three sections and then Mr. Burris will walk through um, the next sections of the bill. Um, the first three sections um, require the Metropolitan Council to submit a um, budget that is uh, somewhat similar to the budget that the um, uh, uh, Department of Transportation submits to the legislature. Um, and if you look in your bill packets, there's a one-page sheet that uh, looks like this. That's the uh, Trunk Highway Fund uh, balance statement. Uh, this would be similar to what the Met Council would um, be required to provide. Um, just show you some of the components of the sheet so it shows the um, uh, actual spending and forecast spending from uh, fiscal 2014 through fiscal 2021, uh, the balance prior um, from the prior year, um, the revenues to the Trunk Highway Fund, the total resources available, uh, the spending between the Department of Transportation um, and the Department of Public Safety, and then um, at the bottom, the balance. Um, so that would be the component that um, the Metropolitan Council would be required to provide for the transportation budget. Um, and most of the language um, for that you can see on uh, page three, starting at 3.8. I'll turn it over to Mr. Burris for some of the other policy provisions. And Mr. Chair and members, uh, there are a few other uh, Met Council uh, financial related items uh, in the bill. Uh, section one contains a, a modification to a legislative auditor review of uh, Met Council as well as uh, CTIB finances to, um, to reduce the frequency of that review. Um, section two is a, is a conforming change. Uh, as Mr. Lee mentioned, uh, section three is part of the, the changes in the Met Council's budgeting and uh, what's uh, contained in this section is, is uh, shifting the fiscal year cycle for the Met Council. So currently the, the Met Council's fiscal year is, is, the, is the same as the calendar year. So it's, it's January 1 through December 31st. Uh, the change in the, in the bill would be for the transportation components of the, of the Met Council, the fiscal year would instead align with the, the state fiscal year. So July 1 through the following. June 30th. Uh, somewhat going along with that is um, a change in Section 5 that would uh, direct the Met Council to use the state's accounting system instead of instead of uh, its current accounting system. So it would be uh, from a kind of financial tracking standpoint uh, treated or, or seen more as a equivalent to a state agency. And then kind of jumping back, um, Section 4 is a, uh, a direction on when the council makes amendments to its budget that uh, that those amended budgets would be provided to the legislature. Uh, and then section six contains the, uh, the forecast and financial information that Mr. Lee um, outlined as, as uh, kind of the, the MnDOT example. Um, so this is more detailed, but, uh, but something parallel to a, a statutory requirement that's in place for MnDOT currently. Uh, and then section seven and eight refer to the Transportation Policy Plan and uh, establish some, is, establishes some additional requirements for what the council would need to provide in that plan to identify three different types of funding um, scenarios from a kind of fully constrained, partially constrained, and then a more uh, envisioned scenario. Uh, sections nine and 10 of the, of the bill establish a, a limitation on use of both state funds and the council's operating budget reserves uh, so that those dollars would not be able to go towards transit capital costs. So it would be a, a limitation um, that would have the, the, the effect of uh, directing state dollars towards the operation side as opposed to transit capital. Thank you, Mr. Burris. 
Um, <laughs> Madam Thank Chair, you. any comments? So, um, Mr. Chair, there is a there's four pages that did not get in to your packets, and I hope those have been distributed. <coughs> okay, but they do um, pull out some the four key key pages in, in my view from the OLA's report, um, and some of these um, recommendations and comments are, are what we've acted on. Um, for example, the assumptions you know that they use in preparing. Um, Preparing their data, I mean, they should be, they should be letting the legislature know what those assumptions are. Um, for example, um, there was one on reserves. I didn't see that reserve comment here, but um, so just uh, I think this is very useful in terms of understanding some of the concerns that um, we have had with the, the Med Council's budgeting. So. Okay. And I don't know if uh, if um, if Mr. Nobles would care to say, make a comment, but he is here. He's waited patiently. Be happy to uh, have any uh, comments or testimony. Mr. Chairman, uh, members, my name is Jim Nobles. I'm the legislative auditor, and um, I am here because uh, Representative Runbeck um, is changing in this bill and in a separate bill, uh, the frequency with which we issue uh, these reports. And uh, I, I appreciate, first of all, <laughs> the fact that she gave us the opportunity to dig in a little deeper uh, into the Metropolitan Council's uh, transit activities. I think we learned a great deal, and I hope you were able to learn, too, from these reports. Uh, particularly and very specifically about the difference in the numbers that have shown up um, in our reports and in other places, the difference between what they report to the federal government and what they report to you. I think that issue has been well debated, and I, it's certainly my understanding in, in visiting with the Metropolitan Council that they certainly accept and understand that it would be to their benefit as well as yours if they more fully explain their assumptions whenever they present these uh, numbers to you so that uh, you can understand what, what goes into coming up with different numbers. So those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Um, I, again, I appreciate uh, uh, Representative Runbeck's uh, work in this area. And um, we would support the change that we would less frequently uh, issue these reports. And, in the bill that you have before you, it would have us do a report only once every biennium, in other words, once every two years. The other bill would have us do one every bi biennium, twice a year. We understand the difference between biennium and biennium. <laughs> so it is your choice as to whether or not you want to receive these reports twice a year are once every two years. Uh, we're comfortable with either approach you, you would like to take. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Nobles, for being here and for your work and your testimony. Uh, members, any questions? We have uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have, I have quite a few. One of them, um, Mr. Burris might be able to answer. So on line 8.18 under funds for transit capital costs, would that mean them being able to even buy buses or fix bus shelters? They couldn't use any of the money for that? Um, Mr. Burris? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Joachim, Capital maintenance is uh, is identified as uh, in the language as as part of uh, transit capital cost. Uh, so I'm not sure if the if the council would have, would have uh, comments on on how they would take it. My reading is that it would the intent would be pretty broad and would uh, would cover um, transit capital uh, bus shelters. Um, it would would fall under that. So then, thank you. Follow up, um, Representative Bernardi. Um, Representative, excuse me, you okay? <laughs> I know what you look like. You're sitting next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, so capital costs, so that is pretty broad. It could be, but they can't use any of their state general money, any general fund appropriations for 
fixing a bus shelter, um, buying a bus. So that's a little, little concerning. Um, and then on, I was just quickly, because I couldn't remember, um, 16A.88 subdivision two, those appropriations are actually um, referenced coming from MBES. So the MBES dollars that go to both greater Minnesota and metro area, um, Greater Minnesota would still be able to use their money however they want, but the investment dollars that go to Met Council, uh, which are statutorily dedicated over there, they would not be able to. Uh, they would not be able to use any invest funds. Is that how that's drafted as well? Question for capital Burke? costs. Uh, Mr. Chair, Rep Representative Joachim, uh yes, motor vehicle sales tax and uh, general fund are uh, kind of the. The key funding sources from from state sources of funds, so it, it, and those are spelled out in the. In the so, uh, Mr. Chair, and I mean, I see Perhaps where you're going. Contact? I think you know the the language. You probably didn't catch it that it is far too broad. I mean, the idea being that state funds are appropriated for operations, um, and that that you know is meant for operations and not for the purchase of. Of vehicles, I think they get bonding through the tax committee for the vehicles, but we can be clearer about that. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, that would be Representative Joachim. I am makes me very concerned that we're now delving into a constitutional amendment, amended dedicated funding stream, and curtailing what yeah. the voters actually voted for. So that concerns me. I'm also really concerned with Section 10 because I, the rest of the bill and the transparency and the audit, I completely get. I. I appreciate the OLIE needing to have a little breathing room. I'm just really <laughs> confused and concerned to why those two sections were actually added into this bill um, because that's a big change. So, I, and I understand, hey, Southwest Light Rail, we took it over at the county level. My tax, taxpayers are now paying for that capital cost and outlay. You guys wanted to do that, we did it. But this says for any future light rail that the state can't do any 10%. So I don't know why this was stuck in this bill either. It just seems to be kind of slid in there. So, Chair sure, Runback. Well, I mean, it it has um, sort of uh, in a in a I don't know, but by, by definition, by default way, it has become you know part of a little bit of state policy. I mean, we are at the moment not funding capital for light rail, uh, and I suppose this sort of forces the issue. So we'll, just, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Bernardi. Yes, Mr. Chair, I was just, uh, first of all, I wanted to understand a little bit more. I feel like it's sort of micromanagement of telling the Met Council what financial system they have to use, but I'm just, I'm surprised that you're telling Met Council to use a state um, technology system. And um, so you must have some confidence that, but why, I want to understand more why are you um, mandating that they have to use SWIFT? I've, I've heard that not everybody loves SWIFT or thinks it's great. So I'm just wondering how did you come to that decision and putting that in this bill? Chair Rombach? I think we're looking for you know the standardization, the, the conformity that comes along with being part of the state, the state accounting system. Uh, uh, you know, it kind of surprised me. We have, you know, these are state funds. This is uh, everything else that is a part of state government um, is a part of that. So, but maybe um, Mr. Lee could could give a little bit more, of, uh, or Mr. Burris. I'm not sure which one. Mr. Lee, want to take that? Uh, Mr. Oh. Chair and members, um, uh, I guess that it's uh, up to the legislature in terms of a policy sense of where they'd want to go in terms of um, the accounting system for the Metropolitan Council. Um, if the council was, um, had to be in the SWIFT system, um, the uh, legislature would be able to access some of the accounts, but um, it's, it's uh, a choice of the legislature in terms of, of, of how that works, so. And then, um, Mr. Chair, I just want to know, would that be extended to all the transit agencies in the State of Minnesota to be use the SWIFT system, or is that just for the Met Council? Uh, I don't think the others come, to, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Bar Bernardi. I don't know that the others come to us for funding, well, so in, well, in a direct way. 
Well, actually, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Chair, um, we do provide funding to uh, statewide transit across the state of Minnesota, and actually, they're getting quite a quite a bit of money right but, now. But, Mr. Chair and Matt and Chair Rumbeck, Senator Bernardi, was there a I mean, they don't come to the legislature. Um, you know, they are not. Uh, okay, well, receiving right. funding from from us, so I don't think that same responsibility probably exists. Okay, Ms. Yeah, well, Bernard, I'm I'm, Bernard. I'm learning in our committee things as we speak, but as I understand that there, the Greater Minnesota Transit is actually coming and asking the opt outs are the opt outs are. Yeah. I, I mean, I meant I mentioned Greater Minnesota Transit, mm -hmm. but there's also the opt outs and asking for a lot of bonding money, like double of what. They, I don't know if it's what the double what that they requested before, okay. or just general fund money for their buses. So I mean, they're coming too. So we're referencing a different bill. So if you don't mind, maybe we okay. can move on. I know Representative Hornstein has a question, and Chair Rumbeck, did you have an, another testifier on this bill? No, no I. Okay, do not. and then I know that we've got a uh, Stephen Hauser on this one too. All right, Representative Hornstein. Um, You're on the list for a question. Oh, just you know, a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I I agree with Representative Yuakima. You know, some of the the reporting requirements, et cetera, it's not the exact same, but I think the goals are not too dissimilar from a bill that Representative Holberg uh, authored back in the day, maybe 10 years ago. I supported that bill, um, but this this Section 9, I I have to tell you, you know. We hear a lot from the majority that they don't like light rail. But what we're talking about here is uh, no capital costs for the orange line, no capital costs for the gold line, no cost capital costs for the very successful arterial bus rapid transit systems. We just uh, learned that the A line is just going great guns in St. Paul. The local bus system that tens of thousands of Minas uh, metro area people depend on, myself included, uh, every day. We're talking about the local bus system. Bus shelters, I'll tell you, I can tell you firsthand, in winter, we need capital costs for bus shelters. Let Just, just trust me on that one. <laughs> so Mr. Um, this is not, this is not, this is not, um, confined to concern about rail. I think this is, you, you, you look at this in conjunction with the cuts from last year and this policy, it's a devastating blow to, to the local but, bus system. Mr. And, Chair? Yes. Chair Rombeck? Rep Representative Hornstein, you did not hear me? I did respond to Representative Joaquin. It, it, we are gonna, it's far too broad. Absolutely. Well, okay. I, I, okay. I want to underline. Uh, Representative the, Hornstein, sounds the like there's a little bit of agreement. You can less finish less. your comment. We've got a few other bills. So, so let me just go ahead. finish. Let me yes, just please. finish. And, and to, the, to the issues that um, were raised earlier, um, we have Greater Minnesota Transit, and we have the opt-outs that, that also come to the legislature for all kinds of costs. So I, I just, you know, Representative Rembeck, Chair Rembeck, I hope that we will be able to rein this in a little bit. But I wanted to give the committee an example of what's going to be impacted if this bill as written advances. And it's, it's a lot of very specific projects that I think are supported on a bipartisan basis. So um, let's, let's proceed with a lot of caution on this. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. Uh, we'll go with our next testifier. Uh, please identify yourself and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Fuser and I represent Metro Cities. Metro Cities represents the shared interests of cities in the seven county metro area at the legislature, executive branch, and Metropolitan Council. Uh, metro Cities respectfully opposes sections nine and 10 of House File 3369. Um, I am happy to hear that section nine will be looked at further. Um, these provisions um, as currently drafted would eliminate state expenditures for capital costs related to light rail projects, um, at least in section 10. These changes are in contradiction to Metro City's policies that support state funding sources for regional needs such as the regional transit system. Metro City's policies also support a multimodal transit system, including light rail transit options. Uh, Metro City's policy opposes legislative directives that constrain transit providers from providing a full range of transit services. Uh, the loss of any future state capital funding for this mode of transit would be a constraint. For these reasons, Metro Cities respectfully opposes sections nine and 10 of House File 3369. Thank you for your time and consideration. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Joachim, you have, okay, you're on the list. You already asked a question, so thank you. Uh, any other member comments? Any other testifiers? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Judd. Shattenham, Welcome to the committee again. Director, thank you very much. And um, just to clarify the question earlier about uh, who receives the motor vehicle sales tax, that those funds are distributed to uh, MnDOT, Greater Minnesota Transit, Metropolitan Area Transit, and the suburban providers get a piece of the 36% of the motor vehicle sales tax that we receive. So it is fair to say that um, they are all participating in the state uh, system and the way I see the bill, it only applies to us. But um, uh, I know that there's been some debate related to this bill already, but I'd like to point out a, a few things. Um, uh, sections three and five of the bill essentially uh, separate the transportation division from the rest of the council. It really does treat it like a state agency uh, by changing our fiscal year to match the states and move our financial um, um, transactions into the state accounting system. And uh, a few of the impacts that folks should be aware of that um, what that would mean is that the council would be operating on two uh, separate uh, fiscal years, one calendar and one state. And uh, that would make things extremely complicated for us. Uh, we would be in constant uh, comparison with each of them to keep our systems in uh, some sort of synchronicity. Um, we uh, also think that we would probably have to um, um, have an additional type of financial software. Right now we use PeopleSoft. Uh, we are uh, thinking that it would take a while to separate those. Um, I, I know that there's been some reflection on what the state auditor uh, said related to uh, how we manage our, tra our transit financials. And um, um, both of the conclusions of what the legislative auditor said was that the council does a sound job of managing our, our financials. Uh, what they recommended was that the council um, disclose more related to how we present to the legislature what we do related to federal uh, reports and what we do with what we prepared for the legislature. And we have spent a lot of time in some committees talking about this, uh, maybe not this one, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, what the council said is that we take those recommendations seriously. Represent or Senator Osmick has a bill in the Senate that basically puts into effect what the auditor's recommending and I testified in favor of that bill. Um, and so, you know, the council is not only audited by the legislative auditor, we're also audited by the state auditor. And the state auditor uh, had the same conclusion that, uh, that we do a decent job. We also come before the legislature and debate our, uh, our budget and provide information that way. But we also look at the um, uh, work with the Leg uh, Legislative Commission on Metropolitan Government that has control over looking at our, uh, our capital budgets and our operating budgets. We, uh, the day after the council adopts a, uh, pr uh, a public comment um, budget, I send that to every member of the committee. I've done it every year since 2003, the day after it is adopted, which is right around the October 20th uh, timeline before it is adopted by the legislature in mid-December. So that information is available. And I also point to you that what the, um, what the legislative auditor already looks like is included on lines 1.19 through 1.14 or 2.1, excuse me, 2.13. All that information is already uh, provided to the, um, to the, um, uh, through the auditor's report, legislative auditor's report. And I don't know if there is, isn't anything that we aren't providing or that we said that we wouldn't clarify uh, based on what the legislative auditor did. There was a question about how we do present things to the federal government. And those were two documents that were never meant to reconcile. They had completely different assumptions. And we, as uh, the Auditor Nobles mentioned, we've spent a lot of time with the Office of the Legislative Auditor to understand that. And I think we've landed on a pretty good uh, place there. Um, a couple of the other provisions in the bill, um, um, our budget amendments, our public information, they're posted on our website. That information has always been uh, made available. Uh, Section 8 makes changes to the transportation policy plan. Uh, we have concerns that delivering a long range plans based on reduced funding would require a reprioritization of projects across the region. 
that could be afforded under that plan and it could end up being inconsistent with state plans and assumptions unless there is a similar uh, requirement of MnDOT because we work together on that long range plan. And so by having a separate plans only throws that thing into um, a, a, a different, it makes it a different document that does not sync with what we're required to do with MnDOT on our long range plan. Um, I'll try to cut some of this stuff out here. Um, section nine uh, restricts the expenditure of state appropriations to including but not limited to MVEST and general funds, including capital maintenance. Well, last year, similar language was in the House Transportation Finance Bill that we opposed at the time because we believe it's contradictory to the intended purpose of the motor vehicle sales tax, which was meant to be used for both capital and operations. And it's also contradictory to how MnDOT uses their 60% of those same motor vehicle sales tax receipts to, se to secure debt for the trunk highway bonds. This language goes further by applying the prohibition to general funds and other state appropriations. And as written, we could not use unencumbered general obligation debts from the Orange Line or the Mall of America Transit Station that were um, passed just last year. And that would put those projects into some serious uh, limbo and potential jeopardy the way that this bill uh, reads today. And I know Representative Rumbeck has mentioned that that, um, that, that section needs some work. Um, we oppose the whole section no matter what. And so I, I, we opposed it last year and this actually broadened it. And so by re bringing it back, we, st we still oppose that. And uh, Mr. Mr. Chair er, and members, um, I'm happy to, to answer any questions you have related to this, but we, we do not support House File 3369. Okay, well, thank you for your testimony. I don't see any other member questions, any other testifiers in the audience. Uh, I don't see any. Thank you, Chair Rumbeck. Uh, with that, we'll lay the bill over for possible inclusion. And then we'll move on to a House File 3346. Well, we, Is that right? We did that. 3469, excuse me. Uh, we will, I will move to bring uh, House File 3469 before the committee and that it be re referred to the Transportation Finance Committee. And uh, we have a testifier on the call, is that correct? We, we do. Uh, okay, so. We also have the, his, um, a PowerPoint. So do we, are we okay. able to So we'll cue that, that up and if you want to introduce the bill then. Great. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, please proceed. So thank you, Mr. Chair. House file 3469 uh -huh. is about shifting the focus of our Metro Transit system to a, a better op option than the exorbitantly and costly fixed guideway transit modes being planned today by the Met Council and those being light rail, uh, BRT and streetcars. The better option is a high speed, high capacity bus transit system, which I would submit to you all has not been looked at uh, by the Met Council, by Metro Transit um, in a very long time. Many folks, even in the legislature, are unfamiliar with the modern day bus transit system and how technology has changed the passenger experience. So here I have to say though, hats off to the Metro Transit Division, which has, um, has uh, seen the light, I say, with its rapid bus transit, the A line, which is now running on Snelling Avenue. It intersects with the Green Line and it's attracting, um, it's very popular. It's attracting riders with its increased speed, usability, and improved passenger experience. So there is a ray of hope in my, in my opinion. There are truths about transit we should all be aware of. The heyday of transit ridership in the Twin Cities was 1980 when 10% of Twin City commuters use transit for their daily commutes. Today, despite multiple billions of dollars invested in light rail corridors, transit's trip share of all trips is down to 6% of commutes daily. The same trend has been occurring nationwide. However, while daily transit trips are down, capital investment on transit has soared due to the fascination with fixed guideway modes and the lure of federal money. And really, probably the lure of federal money is what has driven it. We would not be here if it weren't for the billion dollars on each line that is being promised by the feds. So you know the numbers, two billion for Southwest Light Rail, a billion and a half for Botano, 450 million for Gold Line, 600 million for Rush Line. Another truth is that fixed guideway transit systems are not so much about mobility. In fact, they're really way more about economic development. 
Those were the words of Peter McLaughlin when he addressed the Transit Finance Committee last spring. He said it's all about economic development. And Met Council's TPP, the Transportation Policy Plan, states that their mission is not congestion relief, but providing commuters alternative travel modes. I could touch on other truths about the fixed guideway light rail and BRT, such as that they will never, never pay for themselves. Each ride into perpetuity will be subsidized. It will require 70% subsidy from the taxpayers. And the legacy or lifestyle costs mean that over 25 years, we're gonna double the original construction costs in maintenance, repairs, and capital replacement costs. So think, so think about that. Southwest Light, Light Rail, $2 billion today, but $4 billion over the course of, of the 25-year life cycle. The premise of my bill is simply that we can move more, more people more efficiently in our metro area by thinking about the other options, especially the high-speed, high-capacity bus transit system. It's time the planners took a comprehensive look. So with me today on the telephone, because we don't probably have a lot of folks in the, in the metro that have spent time on putting together a great bus system, okay? Uh, but we have uh, Mr. Thomas Rubin. He's um, a transit expert from, uh, from San Francisco and he has an informative and brief PowerPoint. So I wanna welcome Tom, thanks for being here, Tom. And we're gonna go through your PowerPoint. Is it up? Uh, apparently it, it's <laughs> not on the phone. he's not on the phone quite yet, so we'll get him on, on oh. the, that conference. Somebody's gotta set up the PowerPoint. Oh, is somebody doing the PowerPoint? Oh, okay. The, the the in your packet members, uh, the PowerPoint slides are on there. So apologies to the public. Okay. So we aren't we are not going to be able. Um. Is okay. Dialing him in right now. See if we can get that to work. That's a shame. Anyway, um, I I do encourage you to look at the. The handouts, okay, but but also the presentation. And then if any other members of the public wish to testify, if you could just signal to me and we'll get you on the list. So noted. We can pass. <laughs> so, um, no, <laughs> there's two of us here. At any rate. Um, well, we try to get them on the phone. Uh, all right. Mr. Shatner, do you want to testify now, if you don't mind? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, just related to House File 3499. Um, no, no. Working through this bill, uh, it is a, it's an interesting bill. We're trying to figure out necessarily how it works, but it appears that this, what this bill would do is require the council to develop an alternative to the transportation policy plan that does not include light rail. And the TPP is required under state and federal law and is prepared in coordination with the TAB, local governments, MnDOT, the Metropolitan Airports Commission, and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And under this bill, we would need to continue our current planning process and analysis process and put together another different plan that would contain conflicting information. And so that, that is that's a problem for us. We think it would be a very uh, confusing message to our local and federal partners and other stakeholders that um, engage in transportation planning. It's unclear to us how, um, how quarters that have been identified for light rail or, or um, streetcars uh, would be addressed in this proposed plan uh, on, or bus routes that connect the light rail corridors, uh, how they would be treated under this bill. And um, we're not sure how we would address the LRT corridors that the plan prohibits, the ones that exist today. And, and, the, and we just want to remind the, the committee that the process, uh, the typical process for a planning a, a corridor uh, does not begin at the Met Council, that starts at the local level. And so uh, either cities or counties leave that process. And so what this bill would do, it would require the council to ignore the locally preferred alternatives and guess about BRT corridors. And so we, um, we oppose this bill, we think it's confusing, we think that it is also confusing or would be confusing for our other partners and would be in conflict with the, um, with the transportation policy plan that we're required to, to do as the MPO. And so uh, members, um, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Shatman. Uh, I don't see any, uh, Representative Mason. I just have a few comments. Um, 
First of all, I was on the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority Board for a number of years. When we first opened the Burnsville Transit Station, we, we had the, the parking lot was filled. We had to enlarge it. And the buses that we have, we can't get enough buses because people want to use it. So I'm not getting where your figures are. I mean, people, we just cannot, you're trying to ignore some, the things that people want. I, I just, we're coming from two entirely different worlds. I'm seeing people using transit big time and especially going into uh, the, especially going into Minneapolis. I mean, so many of the people use the light rail. And for us as a body to restrain, instead of trying to encourage and to have a comprehensive transportation system is, it boggles my mind. I just, I, I well, as I said, it's, it's like we're coming from two different worlds and I can tell you the people that where I am, they use transit, they want it, and everybody loves light rails, except the Republicans in the House. And Mr. And Mr. Uh, Chair, I mean, you. this is about, Representative sorry, Mason. are doing transit, Chair. so this is about transit, Chair. and more of it, because I think if you have, um, the, the numbers will grow. If you have if, uh, plans and buses that actually get to where people want to go, um, you'll have more people riding. Well, Thank you. Uh, Representative New. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Chair, my question is, I don't see any prohibitive language, but I might be missing it. Does this prohibit the Beck Council from making additional other transit plans, or does this just require them to, to, to make a bus plan? Does right. that make sense? Chair Rumber. Yes, um, Mr. Chair and Representative New, it doesn't expressly uh, prohibit and we certainly have current lines and so on and so forth. Um, but it does focus on buses, all right? So the main, the main focus is buses. I, I think it, the intention is that we are not going to build any more uh, fixed guideway. That's the point. Fixed guideways mm -hmm. where we're building a special road or laying special tracks um, that are very inflexible, extremely, extraordinarily costly and really you know, uh, in terms of ridership, are they contributing that much more? Sure, but Follow but up. to some of the concerns that have been expressed by Mr. Shetnan and, and and others, this doesn't actually prohibit the things that they're concerned about, right? This just requires a plan for this, which to right. me seems very logical that we would have a right. plan in place yeah. it, for for something that's yeah. more and, malleable. And, 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 and Mr. Chair, Chair and, and Representative New, it could be more clearly, explicitly spelled out that these things work together. Yeah, um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, any other member comments? Uh, any closing remarks? Uh, and, and excuse me, uh, Chair Rumbeck, that doesn't, our technology isn't working or we're not able, doesn't sound like to get uh, Mr. Rubin on the phone. Is that, is that, is it, is it the technology? I mean, he, he is available by phone, but we aren't able, to, that does not work. I think okay. uh, Mr. Barthel tried calling him, right? Three okay. times, so. All right. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to make some. Shame. Yeah, well, uh, closing comments. I don't really have any particular close, closing comments. I would just urge folks to read um, some of the handouts. I think really pay attention to the Washington Post article about the Metro. Uh, it's all in the very first sentence, which is it's, it's mired in disrepair because the agency neglected to heed warnings about the aging equipment and the poor safety culture, chronic breakdowns and calamities. I mean, you don't have that with light rail. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't have that with buses. This is what you get. Um, and especially when we're not putting any money towards the future, the legacy costs are enormous and uh, that's something that the legislature should not ignore. Okay. Thank you. See no other questions, no other testimony. I will renew. Uh, thank you, Chair Rumbeck, for bringing the bill forward. I renew uh, the motion, my motion, to re refer House File 3469 to the Transportation Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. No. no. Uh, the motion passes. <laughs> <Good job. laughs> <I lost. laughs> Um, and the next on the agenda is House File 3682. And I will move to bring House File 3682 before the committee and that it be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. 
And is there anybody in here looking to testify, provide testimony? And please introduce the bill. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and House File 3682. Um, it kind of goes back to last year. Uh, we, the uh, County's Transit Improvement Board, CTIB, um, was basically de decommissioned. So there's a lot of statute pertaining to it. Uh, and this is basically repeals um, that statute and those, uh, that's those statutes, rather. Okay. Um, don't have any testifiers. Mr. Shetnan? He's good. Uh, I don't see any member questions. Chair Rumbeck, any other comments? And then yep. we'll move it forward. Okay, great. No other comments? No comments. All right, then I'll, I will remove my motion to re refer House File 3682 to the Committee on Taxes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those in favor say nay. The motion prevails. I don't know. <laughs> All right, on to House File 3681. I will move that uh, House File 3681 be uh, before the committee and that it be re-referred to the general registrar. And Mr. Chair, um, th this uh, essentially refers to something that came up earlier when, <clears throat> when Mr. Nobles commented that there's two different things happening here, whether they should re be reporting twice a year or once every two years. And uh, this says two times each year. Do we want to hear from them regarding the Met Council fi transit finances? Excellent. Is there anybody that wishes to testify on this bill? Any member questions? Very good. Seeing none, um, I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 3682 to the General Registrar. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, got, this is House File 3681. I'll renew my motion to refer House File 3681 to the General Registrar. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion prevails. Very good. So that concludes our agenda for today. If there's no other comments from um, the chair, um, we appreciate your members' time tonight and those in the audience. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Meeting is adjourned.